car is out of control. So they're going, they're bumping at it. Oz is not afraid to mix it up, and they do mix it up. That's what Grand Am Racing is about. It's the place where we always kick off the Grand Am year. It's the home of the Daytona 500 and Rolex 24. Of course, it's Daytona International Speedway. And tonight, the World Center of Racing welcomes the Rolex Sports Car Series back for a summertime sprint race. This is the Brumos Porsche 250. And just like the Rolex 24, tonight will be a spectacle. More great Grand Am racing, where Brian Till, the diversity amongst cars, engines and drivers, is as impressive as this mighty speedway. Well, Lee, the Daytona prototypes are the big boys of the Rolex Sports Car Series, powered by motors from Ford, Pontiac, BMW, Lexus, and Porsche, all mounted in chassis from some of the world's best sports car designers. Designers like Lola, Riley, Crawford, Delara, and Coyote. And what about the drivers? Names like Gurney, Donahue, Pruitt, and many more. And tonight they'll do battle at the birthplace of Daytona prototypes, Daytona International Speedway, the world center of racing. Tonight's race should be a great one. And with this weather coming in, it could be an iffy one as well. Chris Neville. Brian, the heart and soul of the GT class is the cars that we see on the streets every day, whether it's that rumbling V8 from the American-built Pontiacs or the Fords, or that classic silhouette of the Porsche, or what about that high-revving rotary motor from the Mazda? These cars are great in the GT class. At the 24-hour race, it's all about patience and discretion. Tonight, it's about all-out speed. We've got six different makes, 46 different drivers, but one goal. And of course that goal is to be victorious here at this very, very special venue. Hi everyone, Lee Diffie along with Dorsey Schrader and Calvin Fish. Great to have you with us. It's round eight for the Daytona prototypes, round nine for the GT cars. Cal will be with you in just a moment. Dorsey, you first up. And whenever we come here for this summertime sprint, we always think back to January and the Rolex 24. Two very different races, of course, not just because of time. But uh, at the Rolex 24, the teams have virtually a whole week of, of lead up and build up. This is a very long day. It's a very very hard day it's just a one day shootout how does that change the mindset of the competitors well it means that you really have to unload your race car the beginning of the day nearly perfect the, the crew chief's got to do all his homework look through his notes make sure that he's got the car right the drivers no time to learn this racetrack they've got to get it right right away because it's time to race already speaking of learning this track this guy beside me knows a little bit about it let's go to the pirelli track map of well, daytona international speedway best known as the 31 degree bank high speed 2.5 mile oval but things get interesting when you get down to this road course portion off the 18 degree banking onto the flat at 192 miles per hour things in turn one can get a little bit hairy from there up into the turn three area that is the slowest corner on the course also the most slippery aerodynamic downforce there is none through the infield you go coming off onto the high banking you build a lot of speed and you go down to what we call a bus stop turn eight and nine is a chicane it's a good place for overtaking it's also a good place to get it wrong and have an accident it'll happen before the night's over there's no doubt that sport is built on a bed of wonderful rivalries stuff like the yankees and the red sox michigan ohio state the Celtics and the Lakers. Here in sports car racing in Grand Am, we have our own wonderful rivalry. It's Ganassi and Gainesco. You saw there from Homestead. Now we go ahead to Mexico City where Mamo Rojas and John Fogarty were relentless on each other. This was high emotion at high altitude. And these boys did not let up. And that just reflects the passion in both these championship winning teams in Daytona prototype racing. Look at the intensity, neither willing to yield, willing to give in. And this isn't something new. This has been going on for quite some time. Cal, we really get off on it. We love calling the action. The fans love seeing that kind of rivalry. There's no doubt it will continue tonight and all the way through this season. Absolutely, Lee. And last year we saw a classic championship battle between these two stellar teams that was eventually decided in favor of the Gainesco team. But we come to the season opener, the 24-hour race right here at Daytona, and Ganassi was back on top. Their third consecutive victory, but closely followed by the 99 team. So after round one, it was one, two in the points. As we look at the points right now, halfway through the season, nothing has changed. Ganassi still leads, led by the Pruitt and Rojas, of course, then Gainesco, our second. But the big key is 
Last year, the Gang School team were fourth in points at this stage of the year. But you look at the points deficit, last year was 27, now it's 37. A bigger deficit, they've got to really get hold of some wins here. They're coming off a big win at Mid-Ohio, they have momentum, there's a lot to play for still. Speaking of the top five, a young team doing wonderful things, they're just outside the top five. Chris Neville has more with them. Lee, the 61's been really fast this year, but this is their first Rolex pole. We've seen some mechanical issues and some mistakes by the team, but they are coming off their best finish, fourth place at Mid-Ohio. Ryan, you got the fourth, now you get the pole. Is the team ready to win? I think we are, you know? I mean, we can't claim that we're going to win because we haven't even had a podium yet, but we're running strong everywhere. Mark did a great lap. I mean, I think it's the new track record for Daytona prototypes. And, you know, the, just our package is strong, so I think it's just a matter of time. Want to stay out front, they're going to have to stay in front of the best in the business. And one of those teams, the best in the business, is Wayne Taylor's SunTrust Racing. However, they're still in search of their first victory in 2008 with their Delara. Here's one of the reasons why. Earlier this year at Homestead, Michael Valiente taken out whilst in second. We fast forward to Mexico City. This was a scary one. This was very nasty. Big contact between Matt Plum and Max Angelelli. Severe damage to the car. Ahead to Virginia. Michael Valiente on the left, Memo Rojas on the right. Two hard-charging young drivers, neither willing to yield. And it finishes in an ugly fashion for Wayne Taylor Racing. And that was enough to put Memo Rojas on probation. And the woes continued for the SunTrust Delara. However, with all that being said, and then of course we remember the fire post Laguna Seca, this is their brand new race car. You remember they had to use the old Riley for a couple of races? Well, here you go. Fresh from Italy, this is their new Delara, ready to go. The team have done a great job and they qualified third. A couple of positions further back, there is the familiar Brumos Porsche, appropriate because that's the sponsor of the night. The 58 car of Donahue and Law coming off back-to-back -back seconds. Can tonight they go one position better? Can it be the first win of 2008? We'll find out. Don't <laughs> get wrapped up there, oh. body won't fly. Oh. Fellas is gone! Oh. What's the crew doing to work right now with some of their fine adjustments? Come on. And this is a stunning GT battle. Back of this car, pulling the goal. Two races, two crashes. Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is brought to you by Rolex, a crown for every achievement. By Mazda, on any given weekend, there are more Mazda's road race than any other brand. And by Pirelli, power is nothing without control. We welcome you back. Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series Racing is all about two classes. We've spoken a lot about DP, Daytona prototypes. Now let's talk GT. And here's an overview of the points after eight of 13 rounds. And it's Pontiac, Mazda, Pontiac, and another Mazda in the first Porsche back in fifth place. With more on the GT boys, here's Chris Neville. Well, after dominating the Rolex 24, the Castrol Mazda comes back to Daytona and snatches that GT pole. Still, the Pontiac stumbled at Mid-Ohio. Can you close this gap in the championship? I think right now we're just going to focus on race wins. Obviously, the, you know, the Syntec Mazda is awesome here. He loves this track. Our focus is just to get the maximum points from every event. We've had a little bit of bad luck, but, you know, it's a cyclical business. We'll see what happens. So we're excited about this evening, and we're going to try to maximize the points. For more on the Banner Pontiac, Brian Till. Well, Silva and Trenblay talked about bad luck, but Paul Edwards, you and Kelly Collins, the worst finish of the year or last weekend or last race at Mid-Ohio. When you come here and you've lost a little bit in the points, does it change your strategy, your approach to this race at all? Well, you know, we just got to do our best here. We're really hurting on uh, our lap times around here and overall performance. Um, you know, we got a lot of things going against us. We just got to concentrate and try to not make any mistakes and uh, not get in any trouble. Unfortunately, we don't have much of a race car today, but, you know, we're still looking good in the championship and we got some good races ahead. Well, unfortunately, Daytona International Speedway has not been the strongest track for the boys at Banner Pontiac. Cleet? Yes, they do know that they have a hard night's work ahead, and this is one of the cars they're going to have to contend with. Reigning GT champion, Dirk Werner. There's some light at the end of the tunnel for the Van Bucker Lowell's boys. Dirk put in a blistering qualifying lap and is looking good. He qualified that familiar 87 Porsche in second position. Let's take you 
to what to watch for boys our three points and as always speaking of points the 30 45 minute rule is in effect if you want to score championship points you must do 30 minutes and a mandatory stop within the first 45 minutes and speed is going to be the key here this evening if we saw green flag running and dry this race could go down in just over two hours so strategy will be key will teams take an early pit stop and then just do it on one more dorsey but being dry is a key factor well for those who turned in to watch our nascar brothers they saw the final practice there today get rained out this race will not be rained out we're going to take a green flag and that weather is still in the area what a moment for the young man from toronto canada mark wilkins brian frizzell his co-driver teammate the young guys just 24 each of them and this young team it's only its second year in grand am rolex series competition sits on the pole for the very first time and they're right alongside the defending series champions it's a huge moment for aim autosport as we come to green for the summertime sprint race in the grand am rolex sports car series under the lights at the world center of racing Wilkins gets the jump immediately, pulls in front of Fogarty. It's going to be greasy down here in turn one, Doors. Watch for the stack up in this break zone. You can get caught off on that flat, like I said, real easy. Clean so far. Inside is Valiente, side by side with the Gaines Co Pontiac and pushes his way through. He has been aggressive all season long, and that's a brand new race car getting ready for the GTs. Nick Ham on the right of your screen in the black Mazda that went all the way to victory lane here in January at the 24. And Dirk Werner, it's a drag race here. Werner will be determined to try and round Nick up in turn one. Brakes on the Porsche usually get the job done. The Maz is louder, and Dirk Werner takes the lead, stacks everybody behind him. And Ham locked the left front there as he unweighted the front of the car. He said it's greasy down there. The 69 car shoots wide. Ham responds. Look at that Corvette up to second. Great work from James Gouet in the Stevenson Motorsports Corvette, the 97 machine. And again, this turn is most slippery. It's the slowest corner. No tire pack pressure build up yet. Back to the front, and look at this, we've got a change of the lead already. Michael Valiente for Wayne, Taylor's, uh, Wayne Taylor Racing's SunTrust Delara. This car is on debut. It's a fresh car, a fresh start. The team worked overtime to get it here and get it ready post mid-Ohio. And this is a great way to start. Wilkins on the outside. It's a breaking duel into the bus stop. Fantastic, what a move there, very brave. He said he had to be more aggressive this season. Dorsey, he's doing it right now. And it's a battle of the engine makes as Ford takes the lead over that Pontiac and seems to stretch its legs. Riley versus Delara, problems here for Gene Siegel in the seven. That was a run through on the uh, back chicane. He didn't get stopped for the turn in. Nothing illegal about that. He slowed up, Gene Siegel re-enters at the back. Look at this, this is Fogarty now starting to put the pressure on Valiente. He had a great start, Valiente took the lead, but he doesn't seem to have the straightaway speed. Had a bit of a moment there under braking door. See, the rear end is not underneath him. Not sure these tires are all the way up to temperature yet, and it's a colder evening. Remember, they practiced and did all their practice and qualifying in a very hot summer sun. That's not the case as we go into night. Brian. Guys, you talked about the 10 car being new. This is how new it was. It had only turned four laps, and that was on this past Monday at about 7 o'clock in the evening at Putnam Park just outside Indianapolis. So the team really working overtime to get that car on track. One of the biggest challenges they had was getting the seat remade, a seat comfortable enough to fit both those drivers for this grueling battle in the Rolex Sports Car Series. You know how hard that team worked. They actually got it ready for last Friday. They turned up to Putnam Park. They were about to go out at 8 p.m., and they got rained out, so they had to delay it until Monday, but they at least got to shake this new Delara down, and it runs second ahead of Fogarty. So it's Wilkins, Valiente, Fogarty, and we climb aboard. Enjoy this ride, and I can't help but go back to that outstanding outside pass from Mark Wilkins. That was fantastic. Valiente defended perfectly. He looked around the position for this corner. This is where it happened on the previous lap, but Mark made it stuck around the outside, really showing his stuff now. Maymo Rojas in the 01 Telmex Lexus for Chip Ganassi Racing with Felix Sabanis, the 58 of David Donahue. I think these guys are in the ride mode right now, just kind of taking a look up in front of them to see what's going on up there. That got a pretty aggressive start there for the first lap. It's quite the healthy gap back, but we must say a very positive start from Mark Patterson. Brad Yeager in that all yellow Delara, the 77 Kodak car, qualified extremely well, but Mark has started very well also. And then we go back to the 47 of 18-year-old Ricky Taylor. Chris. 
Well, for the 60 car, Mid-Ohio was a great weekend for them. They had a good finish, but more importantly, they spent a lot of time with their sponsor, Westfield Insurance. They had a great time with them. Westfield was very impressed with the team. They're hoping for bigger and better things in 09. The team did a bunch of testing after that race. They also went to the Shaker rig last weekend at Roush, spent a bunch of time with the Roush engineers on the Shaker. They're focusing on the second half of the season, and Mike Shank says, we're going good places. We're loading. We're coming off the truck real strong, and that's what my boys like. And of course, the Shaker rig is an apparatus that you can bolt your car down to and put the suspension through all of its movements, just like it would if it was out on the racetrack. And you can see the deflection of any single part in there and tune your chassis and your shocks and so forth. And the whole key with that is the support that these teams have from Ford, both Mike Shank racing with the 60 and the 6 machine and the 61 car that's out front. They're getting a lot of technical support from Ford, not only great engine, but also chassis work as well. And that's why these teams made the switch. Here we see the Lola, that green machine. It's the Lola running for the first time here at Daytona. They showed up in testing, Dorsey. They didn't see the speed with that brand new car. Oh. Switch back to the Riley. Here comes Taylor down the inside. He turns Jaeger. That's teammates. That's both from the Doran camp. The two Dallaras come together. And not a bit, a lot of damage because neither of them hit that hard, but it was teammates taking each other out. That's a no no. Here's one of the Crone cars, of course, not going straight, like I talked about with Gene Siegel. It's Tracy That's Crone, Tracy. 75, the and team he, principal. You see, he came to a stop at the cones. He re enters safely, so there'll be no penalty now. There's just enough to throw you off your game door, so you look through that corner, you see some action, you miss your breaking point before you know it, you've passed the corner. And that's exactly what he was doing. You know, Tracy was taking a look at what we're going to look at right here, and that was this side to side contact. Jaeger gets turned. He did. There's a late move by Ricky there. He tried to bail out of it. Jaeger had committed to the apex. That was inevitable. I have to say, that's the first real mistake we've seen young Ricky Taylor make. He has been outstanding in his previous two, three Daytona prototype drives. So Brad Jaeger on the way back. And first on his list is Tracy Crone. Well, what makes that corner so difficult is that the straightaway is so wide. You can get all these different angles of attack to go for that one apex. And drivers that haven't done it before, they get there and realize, uh-oh, I have nowhere to go right now. And they make contact. While we watch our leaders, incidentally, it's the first time the 61 exchange traded gold car has led since Laguna Seca. Frizzell and Wilkins led six laps out in California. But they are going strong here, enjoying the upfront running. Now in GT, the battle's on between James Gouet in the 97 and the 86 of Eric Lux. Remember the 86 fresh from a win at Mid-Ohio. Eric Lux and Lee Keane, boy, did they enjoy that. And it really boosted the spirits of Farn Marker Lowell's as we climb aboard the sister car, the 87, with reigning champion Dirk Werner. Taking us through the left-hand kink, fastest corner through the infield. It gets your full attention, doesn't it, guys? It really does. I mean, he was flat through there. The tires are still fresh. You'll see some of these GT cars struggling a little bit as the tires wear down over the course of the stint. But he is one of the fastest drivers in the world currently in one of these Porsches. He's fresh off the championship last year. It's not been a stellar year for Porsche. They're still looking to really get back on top. Had that victory in the rain. They're waiting to see what they can do in dry conditions. Has the performance balancing dropping that right height done enough? And listen to this screaming mind. Is this one's turning some RPM. Mike Shank Racing, the Ford Riley, making a very early stop. John did run off the track over in the bus stop, so maybe the air intake area. And there is Colin Brown alongside Brian Frizzell. Good to see Colin back in the Grand Am pit lane. We'll be back. Hey, on Monday, don't miss funny man Alonso Bowden in an all-new episode of 101 Cars. You must drive. He'll make you laugh. And this is a show well worth watching. 100 Cars, you must drive. Premieres Monday at 9 Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific. We're back here at Daytona. Welcome back. We continue. It was a pretty frantic start. However, we still have the same race leader, Mark Wilkins, and the AIM Autosport machine leading Michael Valiente and John Fogarty. That's the top three. 
as we go down the pit lane and hear from our former driver in this series. Well, Colin Brown got to steer the 61 car back at the Rolex 24, but since then, Colin, it's been all Craftsman truck and nationwide. Are you a little bit tired of turning left all the time? No, I'm having a blast. I'm driving my number six Colin Freight 450 truck. Uh, and that truck series is so much fun, but it's great to come back and watch these guys. You know, they're doing a great job in the same auto sport, exchange trade a gold car. It was so much fun to race with them in the 24 hour, and they've been close, it looks like, on TV in all these races to having a victory, and hopefully they can pull it off tonight. Fun to race with them last year. Are you going to race with them again next year? I don't know what the plan is. You know, Dan Davis and Ford, he gets to make that call, and I'm just happy to see these Fords running out the front. You know, uh, when we won the championship back a couple years ago, it was a lot of fun, and we always had a lot of power, so it's neat to see these guys running really well, and both Mark and, uh, you know, Ian and all the guys are doing a great job. Ryan's doing a great job, so it's cool to see them. Well, hopefully we'll see him back in January of 09, and these guys are setting up for a pit stop. Well, that will be a key part to the strategy. We thought that some of the teams may take an early stop because you have to make a mandatory stop before that 45-minute mark, Dorsey, and then effectively you'd be able to just split the difference and get to the finish on one more pit stop for fuel. Here's Dirk Berner in his Porsche. He has a very healthy margin over the second place Nick Ham, who has moved up ahead of Eric Lux. Let's hear from Eric's teammate now with Brian Till. Lee Keen standing by watching teammate Eric Lux right now on the racetrack. Great win at Mid-Ohio and I know that there have been some changes over the last few weeks with the Porsche, the ride height being dropped down. How much of an improvement is that for you guys? Uh, pretty good so far. I mean, the last race was great. Uh, everything went, went awesome, of course. Um, so we still would like to have a little bit less weight. Uh, the Mazda here is so fast. I, on his fifth lap in qualifying, it did two tenths faster than Dirk did, so we, we can't hang with that. Um, the Pontiac here, we don't have to worry about too much. Uh, so, I mean, the, the team right now, the Fallmarker team, is doing an awesome, awesome job. Uh, we're Dirk's first, and we're third, so everything's good. Porsche's running good here at Daytona, Chris. Three of our leaders in, the 61, the 10, and the 58, all just in for fuel. The 61 did beat the 10 car out. Now, this is a strategy we anticipated. Since it's only 250 miles, most of these teams could make it pretty much the, the entire distance on one stop. But because of the rules, they have to make it two stops. So these teams came in early, got that one stop done. Now they'll just do their driver changes, probably in about 30 to 35 laps. And, Chris, the interesting thing there is that the AIM Autosport team, the personnel have been beating themselves up about just niggly little mistakes in the pit stops, during the pit stops. Whoa, oh. this is close here. Trying to get through on the 26 of Jerome Jackalone, and he loses the lead of the race. Valiente capitalizes. He does, he did lose position there, Lee, and uh, that could have been a costly move there. Great save, essentially, Dorsey. It got ugly there for a moment, but Mark was wise, chose to jump on the anchors and uh, save that one. Well, it's so frustrating on this racetrack when you get caught in a bind like that. That was GT car competition that these two guys got into, and of course, it's easy to pass when you're up here on the bank, but when you're on that flat infield, you see how quickly you can get in trouble. Reminder that all teams have to, all cars must make that mandatory stop within the first 45 minutes as the lights really come into effect here at Daytona International Speedway now. And essentially why these teams are doing that is if we see a caution, everyone will take that who's not pitted so far and they will assume their point at the head of the field, Dorsey, and then everyone will be on needing one more stop to get to the finish. Great shot there on the Gainesco 99. Look at the exhaust pipes glowing red out the back of that thing. So the revised order with the 10 and the 61 diving to pit road. Fogarty is out in front, Maymo Rowe has second, then the 47 of Ricky Taylor, Mark Patterson fourth, Nick Jonsson up to fifth, ahead of Jim Matthews, who we should give some praise to. Qualified 11th, but out qualified. Some much faster drivers did a very good job in qualifying earlier today. That's why I love the night here at Daytona. It's just magical, isn't it, with all the different visual, and also the smells that you get around here. So it's really, really a great place to come to see a night race. Cars look great. I spoke to Alex Gurney, who's John Fogarty's teammate in this red number 99 machine this afternoon. He said the car is so much better than it was here for the 24 hour race. We've really learned how to make these Pirellis work. We're feeling good. We know we've got a tough road ahead of us in terms of the championship, but they've got some confidence back, Doors. Now you see, look at the difference of those cars right there. All the GT cars run amber headlights, if you're picking up on that. All the DP cars have white headlights, because at night when it gets really dark, you can't can't really see which is which when they're behind you, but if it's an amber light, you know it's a GT car, not a direct competition if you're in a DP. Wait for the 99 Gainesco Pontiac Riley to come there. blasting on by. Is Fogarty close enough? Where is he? This is currently the second place car of Nick Ham. 
And last time by, he was about five seconds behind class leader Dirk Werner. Eric Lux is third, James Gua is fourth, and Tom Nastasi in his Mustang has come up into the top five. A good shot off the side of the 70, looking out the back. Watch that exhaust, white exhaust is so hot. Nick Ham's qualified on the pool position. Lee and I played golf with him yesterday. He's a real gentleman, a good golfer as well. And uh, he was so pumped up about this weekend. They won here last year. They won the 24-hour race. And Mars have the secret to success here. Time to go to pit road. Here's Brian. Go for it. Ricky Taylor in in the number 47. Delara, a little damage to the right front. Fuel only. Ricky Taylor leaves here, guys. But you talk about the lack of experience he has in the Daytona Prototype Series, the Rolex Sports Car Series. Remember, he has driven three different chassis. He's driven the Riley, he drove a Crawford chassis at VIR, and now the Delara. And guess what? He was fast in all of them. More importantly, Brian, he has a lot of laps here. Of course, he did run the 24-hour race with his dad's team at a top five finish, led a lap, which was uh, pretty impressive on his debut. And this young kid is going to go a long way in this sport, Dorsey. Yeah, there's no doubt. A lot of talent. Now we're on board with Jim Matthews. This is the 91 Pontiac Riley. As he works his way out of onto NASCAR turn three, the build speed now. Getting up in the top gear. This is flat out all the way through here. Like I said, 192 mile per hour. That's a pretty good top end number. A lot better than it was just a year ago. Jim did a great job in qualifying. Qualified 11th ahead of some stellar drivers in this field and is now running up in the top five. They've had a couple of poor results. They were second in points for a long time, but two poor results has really dropped them down a little bit. Good toe going. Now there's a lot of draft going on in here. When you're running 190 mile per hour, he's picking up the dirty air off of that car, the drone car right in front of him. That Lola looks pretty good though, the green car in front of him. We talk about the aero efficiency of the car. They can create downforce, or they can really go in low downforce trim on a track like this. So that was the concern of the engineers. Can we be competitive here at Daytona? And once again, you see the car not qualifying well, but racing well in the hands of Nick Johnson. And the 60 of Mark Patterson fending off Nick Johnson. Matthews 5, Cosmo 6, Shane Lewis for Southern Motorsports is in the mix as well. We need to leave the speedway for a moment. We'll be back. I truly want to come back and, and want to watch someday in the Rolex 24. I enjoy the cars. I enjoy the people. I love driving different vehicles. Uh, it's a great experience and really, really something special. And uh, I look, to, look forward to participating in the future. Jimmy has done several, I think, off the top of my head. I'm having a guess here. I think he's done four now, four Rolex 24s, finished second this year. As we go to the sister car that he raced with in the Rolex 24, and there's a drama here for Jim Matthews. He's got a hose hanging out from under the nose on the left front fender, and it's coming down past the windscreen. Well, nose is a job there, Dorsey. Yeah, yeah, he must have made the nose contact. Is out. Oh, we got. Well, there's there's big lockup on the left front. Jim's going to have to make a pit stop. Let's. This is on the inside of Nick Johnson trying to squeeze his oh, way through wow. Johnson. But look there who he's is. into Thanks. there. That's the 07 that, car. That's the yeah. championship leader in GT. And yeah. he was How spinning on his own, get? I think and got T-boned. He might have got bumped in there. We'll have to look at that later again to see because I think he got helped. Pretty aggressive move there by Jim. Jim winds down there. Damage to the front of the 91. Obviously a lot of damage to the nose, but this new design of the Riley chassis for 2008, the Mark 20, has been a vast improvement because the front splitter doesn't come off with the nose. So right now, just the damage to the nose of the 91. The crew will take it off and look at it and see if there's any damage to the radiator underneath. So as the nose comes off, the first inspection will be to the radiator and then the suspension components underneath it. The shroud around the radiator is damaged. I can't tell. No, I see fluid coming out there on the front splitter. So this car is going to have a lengthy repair. Definitely damage to the radiator on the 91. Yeah, Brian, I can see it clear. You know, you got a lot of damage right in that area as well. And that radiator will have to be changed out. And that is not a quick fix. It is. And it's a killer in one of these short sprint races. 24 hour race, you can maybe recover, but you're not going to do it here tonight. Good scrap going on here with the three of Shane Lewis and the 60 of Mark Patterson. Lexus versus Ford. They're both Riley chassis cars. Wow, Ford's hang got on, some top hang on in there. It You're is clear. strong here. 
Swept the front row, remember the two Shank cars sat on the front row here for the 24-hour race, and of course the Ain car on the pole here tonight. Of course, in a track like this, Calvin, it might be downforce set up too. Who's running more downforce in the configuration that they're currently at? Absolutely, but I think everyone was worried about the potential of these Ford-powered machines here at Daytona. I spoke to Timmy Keane today, he said there's eight cars that can win this race on speed, not just strategy, and he said all of the Ford cars you have to include in that group. Well, they've been at the top of the timesheets, almost every one of the Fords, so certainly uh, it's not coincidental that they, they run down this Daytona big banking pretty well. Well, Brian mentioned that the diversity within the prototype ranks, engine, suppliers, chassis suppliers, the various drivers. When you think of the Lexus-powered teams, you've got Southern right there on screen in car number three. But of course, first and foremost, you think about the Telmex Lexus Riley of Chip Ganassi Racing. Let's hear from the man himself. He's with Chris. And lead Chip Ganassi is watching over his Telmex team right now. Chip, last year you were leading the championship. The 99 was back and forth at this race. This year, you're leading again. They're in second, and they're charging. How are you guys going to respond to a second half of the season charged by the 99? Well, you know, hey, those guys are great competitors, and, you know, I mean, you still have to run the races. You know what I mean? That's why they have races. You just don't say, well, they're fast, and so let's give them the trophy. And nor are they going to give it to us. I mean, that's the great thing about the series. It's, it's really competitive. We're starting to see a nice rivalry between these two teams. What are your feelings on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, nice rivalries are fun as long as uh, you win. <laughs> so, uh, no, I don't know. Hey, it's been a good year for us so far in the series with the, you know, the, the Rolex win early on, you know, right out of the blocks. And, uh, you know, Scott and Memo are doing a great job. Um, you know, I, I can't say enough about the job the team's doing. You know, it's, it's just, it, we're in the middle of the season, though, and I mean, you know, the middle of the season, it's hot, you're tired, you're racing week in and week out. Um, I don't know, we'll have to stick around and wait till the end of the year to find out, I guess. Well, they finished on the podium every race this year except Mid-Ohio, where they were eighth. Brian? Well, in the Rolex Sports Car Series, you don't get to celebrate for long. Eric Locks and Lee Keen won at Mid-Ohio in the last round. They'll not win tonight. A fluid leak on the 86 Farnbacher Lowell's Porsche. It sits in pit lane right now. No damage to the radiator. It's not coming out from the engine. It looks like some type of a connection from the radiator back to the engine where it goes into it, Dorsey. So probably some type of a line on the way back, but they started getting overheating uh, alarms on the dash, and uh, Eric Lux had to bring it to pit lane right now. Most of the fluid out of this 86 car, and it's going to be a lengthy repair. Well, Brian, you're right about one thing. The radiators are up there in front, behind the front wheels, but then they're connected with metal tubes, little aluminum tubes that bring the engine coolant back to where it looks the engine, right about here, I'd say, where it's leaking. And there was some work done on that car since the qualifying session. Eric Lux lost third gear, so the gearbox has been out. Maybe something wasn't put back together right. Two of our front-running, hard-charging cars. Three, in fact, in trouble with the 91, the 86, and also the 07, the championship-leading GT car. We'll update you on those when we come back. Another new show coming your way exclusively on speed. It's called Wrecked, and the new series premieres July 17. It's all about riding with Chicago's toughest family of towers, and find out why cleaning up the mess isn't for the faint of heart. It's called Wrecked, and it premieres July 17 right here on Speed. We welcome you back, Lee Diffie, along with Dorsey Schrader, Calvin Fish, Brian Till, and Chris Neville. This is Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series racing under the lights at the World Center of Racing. Almost 30 minutes gone in this race. That means many cars out there have just 15 minutes to perform their mandatory stop. The top seven in this race are yet to stop. Michael Valiente, the first in the order who has performed that time in the lane. When they do stop, however, now any driver who jumps out will get points. They have to do a mandatory 30 minutes, but Fogarty has really been laying down some sensational laps. Low 43s, the rest of the field are in 44s and 45 mode, so he's really spreading that gap, Dorsey. Yeah, no doubt about that. But, you know, we're going to see all these pit stops happen here within the next 15 minutes, so... While we're in that last break, Mark Patterson was involved in a uh, very healthy duel with Shane Lewis <laughs> in the Southern Motorsports Lexus, and Shane eventually got the better of him, and I'm sure his co-driver Bill Lester is pleased about that, Brian. 
Well, Bill Lester watching Shane Lewis move the Southern Motorsports car up to third. Bill, you got to be happy to come back to Daytona because not only is this where you and Shane partnered for the first time, this is one of the few tracks that you've come back to. Uh, a lot of the other tracks that you've run this year, you didn't know. Yeah, no question about that. You know, we obviously had a baseline set up that we could come back to, and uh, that's helped us out a lot here. And Shane's having a real spirited battle with Mark Patterson, and I'm hoping to think that he's going to continue to hold him off and that uh, I'll be able to carry us on home. 99 is in, the Gainesco car on pit road. And the driver change being performed. 17 laps in, 10 laps more than the other leaders who took that earlier stop. Ryan's there. 99 car is in. I'm noticing a lot of steam from the overflow valve in the back. Tells me this 99 car may be running a bit hot. I'll try to get a look at the screen in front right now. It looks clean. Driver change being done. Alex Gurney going in. When I check the screen up front, it is clean. Now, this car last year found a great balance. Remember there, the repeat winner here. They found a great balance between downforce and uh, straight line speed. It looks like they found it again because John Fogarty was laying down some tremendous lap times, as you guys pointed out. Lee. The 01 is in also. Look at this pit stop stall. It's right at pit out. Spoke to Timmy Keene. He said, when we're doing the 24 hour race, we're pit in. That's near the garage in case we need to do work. Pit out. We don't have to worry about the blend line. No pit lane speed limiter. You just burn it out of pit lane like you did. Well, in the 01 coming in, Scott Pruitt. Pruitt got behind the wheel of that car, as did Alex Gurney. And the 60 is also in. Oswaldo Negri taking over the wheel of this car. It's going to be a quick stop here because they've only been out for about 18 laps. So they're going to take on about half a tank of fuel. Very good stop. Four tires, half a tank, and Negri is back out. You can see they changed one of the windscreen tear-offs after 18 laps, which lets me to believe, leads me to believe that it is uh, somebody leaking some oil out there, or maybe he was behind the car that had the uh, radiator or fluid leak. You saw a big smile there on the face of Mike Shank, who was climbing over the wall. He always assists with these driver changes. You get an extra man over the wall if the other driver gets out of the way. He basically substitutes the driver getting out. And he thinks that Negri has a chance today. He said we need the perfect cause, the perfect strategy to be in the game here tonight. They got that Ford Power, they're looking good. Let's hear firsthand what it was like inside the 99. Well, Lee, not only did they win last weekend, but John, you guys won this race last year and you had a great balance on the car. It looks like you unloaded with that same balance from last season. Uh, yeah, hi William, hi Sarah, hi Mom. Um, car's good, you know, Daytona is a pretty unique track. You gotta run pretty trimmed out here, but uh, you know, it's it's working well. I mean, uh, it's great, we're, we're here with Gainesville Auto Insurance. They got a, a headquarters right here and we have a ton of fans, so um, it's great to be out front for them. But car's good um you know a little different pit strategy going on up front but i think uh i think we're playing it right bob stalling said after mid ohio he said i forgot what it took to win but winning is a routine and we're back in that routine are we going to see it again tonight yeah I, I hope so you know it's uh it'd be great if we can get two in a row that that's what really builds momentum but uh i think the hardest thing about winning is sitting on the pit stand while alex is out there it's about 10 minutes to go that's uh that's pretty tough on the old uh, ticker well, the 99 certainly put it to him right now. Chris? Well, the 76 is in. Nick Janssen out. Ricardo Zonta getting behind the wheel. In the past couple races, this car has led. And then late in the going, the team was a little bit wrong on their strategy, which pushed the car back into the field. Nick Janssen saying, hey, guys, let's just follow what the 01 is doing. They've got this strategy figured out tonight. That's exactly what they're doing. They're pitting one lap back. Boy, did you see that Strong that front pit rotor? stop by these guys. Fresh tire, Zonta out on the track. That was a hot front rotor when he yeah, put that It really was. Right. It was glowing. And you see that at night. It's sensational for the fans here to watch and also the viewers at home. JC France exchanges with Portuguese driver Joao Barbosa is behind the wheel of the famous 59. And we're still waiting for the man up front, Shane Lewis, for Southern Motorsports to come in and make that stop. We'll be back. <laughs> It's just an awesome place, you know. I mean, I think if you come here and you see the kids and you see how happy they are and how much of a good time they're having, I mean, there are a lot of kids that are facing some serious um, hardships in their life and they get to come here absolutely for free and they get to leave that all behind, hang out with kids that, you know, are facing same, you know, similar things in their life and just have fun, just be a kid. And, you know, every kid deserves that and it's, that's what the camp's all about. But because we are a medical camp, it is important to note that some of the illness groups that we serve probably don't have the opportunity to go swimming because of the illness that they have. Pool, yes, it's a lot of fun, 
but it really serves a multitude of purposes. And really that's what Boggy Creek is about. It's about healing, it's about empowering, and that's what we try to do with all the groups that we serve. And who's ready to play golf? Yeah! I've been out here uh, at least three or four times already, and uh, it's always a great experience um, to see what these people do here, the amount of energy that's uh, put into this, and uh, to see these kids and how happy they are, and, and uh, the, the, the extreme that people go through to make them that happy. It's just a wonderful place. Camp Boggy Creek, the official charity of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series, and uh, well done to the Frizzell brothers once again for hosting their uh, charity golf tournament and a lot of drivers turned up yesterday and to Sarah Gerdes and all of the staff down there at Camp Boggy Creek which is not too far from the speedway here they do a wonderful job for so many ill children every single year problems there with the J-Lo Porsche dramas there for the 63 of Jim Lowe and that could be a big oil down, which is not going to make anybody behind him very happy. He's made it to pit lane. And I can't really say where that is coming from. It looks more like an oil line than it does coming out the exhaust tips. We'll see in a minute. Big plans ahead for this team. Jim, uh, maybe not 09. He's thinking more 2010 of starting his own team independent. Remember, he had a long-term relationship with TRG, with the J-Lo Racing uh, brand and entry. So he's got some big plans ahead for he and Jim Pace, and we wish him well in that endeavor. On board with Nick Ham. I don't know which car that was, I think it's a 63 car. That was Nick just saying, I think somebody blew a motor, the communication was going on. Go for it, Brian. Dirk Werner in and his farm marker lulls, force of the number 87, tires and fuel. He stays behind the wheel, you're defending GT champion in the Rolex Sports Car Series, having a good run tonight. And ever since these guys got to lower these Porsches an inch, basically, is when it's kind of the handling has really come back and Werner has come alive. You did notice when he said somebody blew a motor that you couldn't see out the windscreen. Yeah, yeah. that was That's really dark. probably completely oiled down. He probably lost the engine right here again. Look at this. Now, our camera can see through that muck a lot better than your eyeball can see through there. And you think if Nick Ham had to go through it, Werner, who was the leader, probably had the same thing. So maybe he was going to come in anyway. He had to do that stop before the 45-minute mark. But if he couldn't see, maybe they pitted a lap or so earlier. Of course, if this is oil, it gets worse and worse because all of the debris, all the oil and the bugs and things around here sticks to the oil now. The good news is Nick Cam has to make a pit stop here within the next three or four minutes. So he'll be able to get that windshield refreshed. And I expect we'll see... That's Nick's voice there, talking about whether we want to shift those or we're going to pit next lap. We're going to go by start finish and pit on the next lap. Now the sister car, the 69, it's a race winning car this year, Emil Asentato and Jeff Siegel were victorious at the six hours of the Glen along with Nick Longy. They sit in third place at the moment. Incidentally, there are a couple of other cars that need to pit. Brad Yeager in the 77 Kodak Delara. He needs to come in. Likewise, does Nick Ham, as we've already mentioned, and so too Tracy Crone in the Proto Auto Lola car 75 must pit within the next couple of minutes. He'll stay out for one more lap. He was very much under the weather at Mid-Ohio, but feeling much better. He had really a case of vertigo. He said, I was dizzy at Mid-Ohio. He said, I'm not 100%, but feeling much stronger this weekend. In the 15, Tom Nastasi, the Mustang is back and Tom is diving for pit lane. He needs to dive for pit lane. We don't have much time left before they're in jeopardy of going by the 45 minute. He and Jean-Francois Dumoulin teaming again and JF saying it's great to be back in this car. They have plans oh. to run another car, but it didn't quite come online as quickly as they would have liked. As we shot see his pit there a little bit in the 57. They've had victories this year. They're on pit lane. Chris Neville is there. 
And it looks like Robin Liddell is going to take over. This team has been struggling a bit with the weight percentage change to the GXPR the past couple weekends. But at the Monday test at Mid-Ohio, Mike Johnson said the car started to come alive. He started doing some ride height changes. And what the problem has been is on entry, the car has been very loose. But with those ride height changes, he said the car was much more drivable. However, coming to Daytona with the banking, the ride height changes just don't seem to work. So Mike Johnson said, tonight we're going to struggle. We're going to go for a good, clean run. Hopefully a top five finish because we're just really looking at trying to get to the 70 car because the 07 is so far out in front in this championship. Brian? Well, Tom Nastasi was just in in his number 15 Mustang. It was fuel only, so they decided to stay on the same set of Pirelli slicks back on track, and that car has been laying down a pace all weekend long, Lee. You remember that pass earlier on where there was lap traffic involved between Mark Wilkins and Michael Valiente? Well, at that time, it wasn't for the lead of the race, but ultimately it proved to be for the lead of the race because this car here, the SunTrust Delara with the Pontiac power plant, Michael Valiente, the Canadian behind the wheel, is the new race leader. He leads Mark Wilkin, the pole sitter, and Alex Gurney in the 99 Gainesco is up to third. Chris, tell us more. Well, interesting strategy on the 70 car currently leading GT. They're just doing fuel, so Nick Ham staying behind the wheel. Sylvan Tremblay doesn't even have his helmet on, so the team's saying, we're going to leave him oh. out. Oh, and that uh, was try to do that driver change a little bit later in this race, so that next driver's, that next stop is going to be a little bit longer than the teams that have already done their driver change. It'll be interesting to see what they say about that little thing right there. There's Craig Stone almost coming together there with the 70. They must be getting great tire wear with these Pirellis, Dorsey, to be able to do that. I mean, typically with the fuel going in, in this form of sports car racing, you can change tires when the refueling is being done, so you don't lose the total amount of time that it takes. So, good strategy call, we hope. <laughs> Brian? 77 on pit road, Brad Yeager getting out, Memo Gidley getting in, another one of the Ford Power Delaras. Fuel for Pirelli tires, and Memo Gidley will get out onto the Daytona International Speedway. So great to see the Delaros running so well here. Remember, these cars have never raced at Daytona. We've seen them pretty much since Daytona, but they did not race in the 24. So great to see the performance of the Delara here this evening at Daytona. Yeah, they were very anxious to find out more about that. It came online at Homestead. See him standing on a splitter like it's going to stop him if he about dumps the clutch? <laughs> That'd be a free ride is what that'd be. Amazing the strength of that it's body work. And this is a long fuel stop yeah. here. There's something to miss here. There's got to be a venting issue. Kevin Doran in the back, the ground there, Brian. Yeah, I see fuel leaking out. Actually, Calvin, as they're trying to put it in, right down at the bottom, one of those is a vent hose, one of them is a filler. And a lot of fuel leaking out. Kevin Doran had wiped it off before, and now they're going to try to put it back in. Kind of burp the system. Sometimes you get an air bubble in there, and the fuel won't flow but definitely a problem here on the fueling rig on the 77. Uh, that's a shame, you see this. Oh, oh, the, the race leader trouble. is off. Michael Valiente has gone wide at turn one. Wow, you'd have to think that maybe traffic was involved in that situation, but got to regroup here. The oh, car looks trouble. loose though. Right maybe. rear, I think he's got a right rear yeah, down. Yeah, you're right, Doss. It looks like the right height off the right rear. It looks like he's cut a right rear. Look, Look at, at his eyes. There. Watch he this. is working hard. He's got a slow puncture, I guarantee you. Watch, here he is in the brake zone. Look, watch the right rear tire, if you will. See if it locks up, as if it's got a light puncture. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Wow, wow, and a great wow. save, but he's got a light, low puncture. That track area has been changed, the runoff area. Normally you'd be in trouble in this massive blacktop out there to recover Dorsey. I think a lot more tracks need to do this sort of work. That would have been a crash last year, for sure. When that used to be grass, that would have been a crash. The focus on Valiente as he tries to get this wounded car back to pit lane. When we come back from the break, we'll update you on it. At Daytona International Speedway for the Brumos 250, Wayne Taylor and his SunTrust team cannot catch a break while leading the number 10 driven by Michael Valiente cuts down a right rear tire and has to limp all the way around Daytona International Speedway to the pits. They lose a lap in the process and they lose a hope 
for coming back with a victory, Lee. Do we uh, just go ahead and add that one to the low light reel again? Yeah. You have to feel for them. Let's go back and show you exactly what happened to Valiente. He's got a cut down right rear, and it's a very slow leak. He doesn't know it yet. The car's not in a bad attitude, but watch it lock up right rear, left front. Bias because it's down on the right rear. Yeah, that diagonal crossway, that was really the indicator that he had that right rear going down and a great recovery by Michael Valiente. But this team have to be gutted. I mean, to come back here with no laps here on this chassis, to qualify on the second row, lead the race, and then to suffer a blow like that, that's just devastating to the whole crew because they worked so hard. Of course, the car now a lap down and you, it's going to be awfully hard to be able to try to get that lap back. I don't think it'll happen. Righto, let's hear from Valiente. What happened, Brian? Well, Michael, just look, when it looks like you guys are back and having the night that you need to have as a team, it all goes wrong. What happened from inside the car? Uh, I had a really bad vibration about 20 laps uh, before the tire blew up. So I slowed down because it was it was so loud. It was it was uh, I couldn't even hear the engine. And then going into turn one, it just blew up, and I almost went off. So. It's tough luck for the SunTrust team because we've been working so hard. We lost the power steering, but the car was still quick enough to win. In typical Rolex Sports Car Series fashion, I know it's been close racing tonight and there's been a little bumping and grinding going on. Any contact that may have cut that tire down? No, I mean, uh, the only person I, I had a little contact with was uh, the number six car. They came out on full tires and we're lapping them and it was like they were racing us for the lead and, and I just ran to them a little bit from behind. Other than that, I don't know. Thanks a lot. Best of luck. Now, guys, let me tell you something. At 192 miles an hour, when you have a vibration so bad you can't hear the engine for several laps, you made a mistake. You should have gone in and pitched because that's a danger. That, vibrations don't fix themselves. That's right. It's a tough call to make, uh, but when you're leading, it makes it even tougher. Back up front, Mark Wilkins is enjoying life as the race leader. He has one of the defending champions chasing him down with Alex Gurney. We should make mention that the Gaines Co. team have about 100 people together tonight at a place in Dallas, Texas. It's their third annual viewing party. And, of course, we all know what the employees and friends are hoping for tonight. They're hoping for a repeat of Mid-Ohio. They want that red car to be victorious again. Well, I'll tell you what, Alex Gurney is doing a tremendous job here. He's just under a second behind the leader, Mark Wilkins. They're running a very similar pace. We're hearing that some other leaders in the pit lane right now. Chris is there. Well, David Donahue bringing the 58 machine to pit lane. This is unscheduled. Darren Law will get behind the wheel, but the problem is, is the headlights were dying out, and we need them here tonight. Grand Am bringing this car to pit lane. It looks like it's probably just a short in the system, so they're going to have to take a look, try and maybe pull some of the circuits and, uh, and see if they can get that fixed. They're not going to take the front nose off and see if anything is unplugged there. A bit surprised about that, so hopefully they can get these lights going again, but Darren Law going to get behind the wheel. This team, we thought they had shaken all the bad Bad luck with the past two finishes being second place, but it looks like that bad luck monkey has climbed back on their back. Now, one of the crew members here did jump in the passenger side door. I couldn't tell if, uh, if he did anything. We'll get another crew member over on Darren's side, so they're definitely trying to work underneath the dash to see if they can get the lights going on the 58. But an extended stop here. This team looks like the bad luck starting to come back. Yes, they have been told by Grand Am officials they will not be released from their pit box until those lights are fixed. There we go. Catch-up time for Darren Law, but to lose that much time under green is brutal. It really is, and the key part is 31 out of 70. They will not be able to do it without an additional stop tonight. It just wouldn't be Sunday night without spending a little time with Dave Despain and two guys who will be spending some time with Dave this Sunday night on Wind Tunnel, Gary Selzy and Casey Kane, the two special guests. Wind Tunnel, Sunday, 9 p.m., live with Dave. Now let's bring you up to date if you've just joined us because one of the points Calvin made was this happens fast and it is happening fast. Of course, the two classes have separate starts and it was on right from the beginning. Move of the race, pass of the race, Mark Wilkins on Michael Valiente. That was just outstanding. And then this was for the lead again. Valiente on Wilkins this time. And then inside, Ricky Taylor tags fellow Delara driver Brad Yeager in the bus stop and Brad had to play catch up from there. And then Wilkins gets balked. 
by the Porsche of Jackalone and Valiente capitalizes. They had just come out of the pits for their mandatory stop within the first 45 minutes. Now have a look at this mayhem. Well, you see Jim Matthews there, pretty aggressive move. Everyone's stacked up. He bashes into Nick Johnson to his left, and he turns around the 07. Kelly Collins, our GT championship leader, but they've recovered well. Jim Matthews, however, major damage to the front end. The Riley Matthews boys went to work. This is Jim Lowe in his Porsche, and major dramas here on the banking. Thankfully, he was close enough to pit road, and then uh, just a few moments ago, a really scary ride for Michael Valiente while in the lead of this race. He said he had a severe vibration for several laps and it ended like that. Gee. We now climb aboard the Pontiac of Kelly Collins. Can you update us please, Brian? Just checked in with the Banner Racing team. That was a very hard hit that Jim Matthews laid on the 07 there in the horseshoe. Checked in with the team, they said we're fine, we're just grinding out laps right now. Came in and did a quick splash to satisfy the 45 minute rule. But back on track, the car seems to be running well. Kelly has no complaints. Checked in with JLo Racing on the 63. Not an engine on that Porsche, but a gearbox problem. So they've retired that car as they've lost the gearbox. So a short night for today's view of JLo Racing. Speaking of the GT class, it's Nick Ham, Dirk Werner, Jeff Siegel, Mazda, Porsche, Mazda, then the Corvette of James Gouet, and then this car here we're riding with now, the current class points leaders, Kelly Collins, Paul Edwards. Back up front, this is for the lead of the race. It's Mark Wilkins and Gurney for the Gainsco Pontiac. They've been running very similar lap times, but traffic is now playing its part. Will Gurney force the issue? That Ford Power, though, Dorsey, it really seems to stretch out there. Yeah, you know what? You're exactly right. Gurney's car is faster on the infield. It's got the handle on the better handling through the infield. But the Ford Power, without question, plays into effect every time they get to that big banking. Chris. Well, guys, I think you also have to look at when last pit stops took place for the 99 and the 61. The 99 was just in probably about uh, 15 laps ago where the 61, they came in on lap five. So they're 29 laps into their stint. We should see them in pit lane in the next lap or two for not only their final stop, but also to get Brian Frizzell behind the wheel. So that car running a light load of fuel, but also very worn tires. Yeah, you're right, Chris, because they did not take tires. Of course, Gurney did, so his tires are in much better shape. And the light fuel load could accommodate for that straightaway speed, too. Scott Pruitt is in third place. However, some 18 seconds behind this red rocket, Bill Orblin has got the Ruby Tuesday Championship Crawford up to fourth, ahead of Oswaldo Negri, who is in five, ahead of Ricky Taylor, Shane Lewis, Juan Barbosa, Zonta, and Ryan Dial in the number two Samax BMW is in the top ten. What a job that this AIM team, motorsport team, has done, though, Lee. I mean, you know, they're one of the new boys in this series. To come out and stick the car on the pole and be leading like this is very impressive. They roll off the truck quick, and that's what these one-day shows are all about, Dorsey. Yeah, for sure. Right on board right now, this is Dirk Werner getting passed by the Brumos car. Watch. Let's watch and see if he can take this left-hander flat like he did earlier in the session. pretty good to me and he's now in second spot and the reason being is he took tires and the 70 machine did not so that saved the time in the pit stop and from the Porsche to the Mazda Joe Foster for the Hypersport team and let's enjoy the ride enjoy the sound turn it up Mine did it flat out, but his foot did it. Oh, you see the chrome car running wide there through the horseshoe off to his left. 75 of Eric Van Der Poel behind the wheel and did run out onto the grass as we go inside the cockpit of the 07 Banner Racing Pontiac GXBR. Kelly Collins has really had to work extra hard for it tonight. They knew they were in for a tough round here and a tough race at Daytona, but this has been even more difficult. They'll be very happy to be running in the top five, however, on this racetrack, which is their nemesis. Now this time, Max Angelelli, Pontiac power. Back in 17th position. Trying to make that lap back is so difficult this year. There's no lucky dog where if you're the lead car on the a lap down, you don't get that wave around anymore. 
You have to fight for it. These guys got home from mid-Ohio. This car was a bare chassis. This team, based in Indianapolis, just did an outstanding job to get it ready to race. The 01, Scott Pruitt is on pit road. Chris Neville is standing by. Guys, we're starting to see these final pit stops. Two laps ago, the 76, Ricardo Zonta was in for his final stop. Now we're seeing Scott Pruitt. It's going to be fuel and tires. Now, it's only been about 15 laps since Pruitt was in last. So this is going to be a quick stop. No driver change, just tires and about half a tank of fuel. So this should be about less than 20 seconds here. This team has got to make sure everything is perfect so they can make sure the car is completely done with the stop is when the fuel when the fuel is done. Everything looking so good so far. Tires done, car down, just waiting on those last drops of fuel to go in. Pruitt is away. Good stop. When you watch the Ganassi team in their pit stops, what do you notice? There is never any panic. There's never any rush. They're smooth. They're calm. They're controlled. They're and orchestrated. It's, it's all about practice. It's all about rehearsing, Lee. I mean, you've got to do your homework. You can't just expect to show up on race weekend and do the job. You've got to rehearse, and those guys do it regularly. They're the best in the business. They don't make mistakes. And I think the fact that the Chrome team... Oh, oh trouble! You Mark saw the Wilkins. sparks. You saw the sparks indicating again a low tire. He had low ride height. Uh, didn't get into the Can wall. he get into the pit lane? This may be his savior here. If it's just a puncher, this may save them. That was almost identical to Joao Barbosa at the Rolex 24. It is a right rear tyre. This could play out though, Dorsey. They needed to make one more stop. Wow, this could be a break. It is a break. A little body damage as you see the 99 in for its final stop. What a save. What? Well, a little bit of luck too, but oh, yeah. <laughs> great control. You can need a driver's suit change Woo! along with the driver's yeah. suit. Let's go for it, Brian. Alex Gurney on the 99 on pit road. A little bit of brake fire on the right front, but nothing to worry about. Full tires, four tires, and a full load of fuel. Alex Gurney will be back on track, but the drama was with the 61, Chris. And the 61 is in pit lane here. This team has got to do everything right. We just saw a perfect pit stop by the Ganassi boys. This team has got to get everything perfect. They've got a little bit of damage back on this right rear corner. So I'm thinking that they're probably just going to whip away some of these uh, little aerodynamic devices on the back of the car to help some of the drag. But nobody nobody dealing with it yet. Just waiting for fuel. The car still up in the air. This is going to be a longer stop because the tank was essentially dry on this car. And uh, nobody dealing with any of the bodywork hanging off of this car. Fit the prize there. Now, I highlighted that wheel, folks at home because it had a bunch of damage to it which means that this car made contact with another car somewhere and we got to give Pirelli the, the pat on the head there right because that tire wasn't the issue there was a contact made and that wheel was cut you could see it I think I would have liked to have seen one of the team personnel grab that loose piece of yeah, bodywork so that Grand Am don't force them to come in because it is a danger it goes oh, flying oh, off there's still a problem just call tires there, maybe well he might have been a tow link if it hits that hard yeah We'll take a look, but I mean, there's damage to that wheel. This now, was a scary ride for Mark Wilkins. Watch the sparks first. First indication he's losing pressure in that tire. And then here at 160 plus mile per hour, coming around down, he goes. Coming down on the apron though, Dorsey, that could have done the damage Definitely. to the rim as well, because you got severe yes, difference in angle Calvin, there. Calvin, you're right. You're absolutely right. That could have done it. That was a wild ride he took, but right at pit in, so save them precious seconds on not going around the whole lap. Chris, scariest moment of his young career. A little talk about a wild ride, but he's smiling down here. He just got to see our replay. What was going on there? I don't know. Uh, a little more than I bargained for, I think. <laughs> it just uh, felt the vibration in the rear, like going through the middle of the banking there, and uh, man, I just tried to keep it off the wall. And uh, I think we're fortunate. I think we did. And. Uh, Hopefully, uh, you know, these, this set of tires is good. I mean, the tires were great till that point. I don't know why that one would have blown like that. It's very, very weird. Uh, but, you know, spectacular car. Uh, you know, we made some changes for the wet, so it's not quite as quick as it would have been uh, had we stuck with our dry setup, but we were didn't know, so we uh, took the middle of the road route. Well, the 61, strong run tonight. Let's just hope that that car is still in good shape and can contend for their first win. Well, Calvin, your call was the correct one. The tire or the wheel was damaged because he hit that apron at so much speed there. But he heard, again, a vibration which led to that demise there. And there you have it. That's like it sits up front and in GT. Nick Ham for Speed Source still enjoying life up front. This was one wild ride.
Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is powered by the first ever Pontiac G8, the official car of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. We welcome you back to Daytona Beach, Florida. You're watching rounds eight and nine for DP and GT of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. And for the first time tonight, boys, we are under a full course caution. And let's tell you the reason why. There are some debris on the racing surface, and we believe it's due to the number 21 Pontiac, the Matt Connolly car, and Ryan Finney is the driver at the moment. That's pretty obvious as to why Ooh, and what yeah. it is. Left front completely gone again, and these are punctures. So there must be a lot of debris other than this obvious debris. Now, there seems to be some misfortune out on the track, but one team enjoying a turn in fortune is the 23 Ruby Tuesday Championship Racing Team. Brian? Well, that's right, Lee. Maybe their bad luck is out of the way. They certainly had it at Mid-Ohio. You guys never even saw the green flag. But, Bill, this Crawford seems to be working better for you guys here this weekend. Yeah, it's a struggle. We're actually 11 miles an hour down the straight. So it's, it's like, very frustrating when you watch them drive away in the distance. But, you know, the Ruby Tuesday team, Alex Joe, I got to say, uh, Alex, uh, Joey and I were eating the mini burgers right before the race. Feels good, no problems. I mean, I'd get to Ruby Tuesday right away. I got to say hello to Yvette. You know, I miss you. I'll be home soon. We just have work to do, a lot of work to do. I mean, we came out late and uh, they did a coast down test that helped us. We got some more downforce. We need like 10 times that amount now. Well, they're working away, guys. And who says the drivers aren't athletes? They're eating cheeseburgers before they come to the racetrack. Sounds like you, Dorsey. We thought it was going to be <laughs> crab cakes, but we guessed wrong this time. <laughs> As we always like to do, we'll make the most of this caution period and we will squeeze in another commercial break. So when we come back, we'll go racing. You're watching Grand Am on speed. Still under caution. Here at Daytona International Speedway, the Brumos 250 continues. And we ride aboard with Max Angelelli, the number 10 SunTrust Dallara. Now, Wayne Taylor Racing is one of the cornerstone teams of Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series competition. And it was a very significant and special day today, not only for this team, but also the series involving a special partner. We're very excited to talk about the fact that we have just recently signed two new agreements, an extension to the current contracts that we have with both Grand Am and with Wayne Taylor uh, for the long term. We're very excited about this. It's a great business opportunity for SunTrust. It's a great partnership for SunTrust. And what we have with Wayne Taylor Racing is something that is incredibly special and has worked incredibly well for us. And that same exact thing can be said about Grand American Road Racing. And there is team principal Wayne Taylor, the man himself, and uh, would be a little frustrated at the moment because he had a race leading car and currently he is down, his driver Max Angelelli is down in 17th position, trying to fight their way back. Also after a pretty scary ride for Michael Valiente. Class leaders in, go for it, Chris. Well, the car that won the Rolex 24 just a few months ago in pit lane here and leading overall, Sylvan Tremblay getting behind the wheel. So this is gonna be a driver change, so it could be a little bit longer stop here than some of the other GT traffic, a little bit further down pit lane. All of our leaders in for their final stop right now. Looks like fuel and tires by just about everybody, but these guys having to do this driver change too. The car still up in the air, tires done. It looks like they did get the driver change done, so that's good, so fuel still going in the car and then they'll be down and away. Many of the teams on pit road, well, all of the teams on pit road, operate as a family. But for some teams, as we see the Farn Barcalol's Porsche get on by and now the Speed Source Masters released, we can give you one example where the family ties go a little bit deeper. We just showed you Wayne Taylor, his 18-year-old son, Ricky Taylor, is driving in the 47 and yes his 17 year old son jordan is now behind the wheel of the buyer crawford have a good run we're back we are still under caution as you watch grand am rolex sports car series competition here on speed so the field condensed Compact, ready to go, but lights are still on on that all-new Pontiac G8 pace car. So we wait for those to go off. That will signify we are going racing with race leader, defending champion, Alex Gurney. John Fogarty started the race, did a good job. 
Let's see if the Gainsco gang can make it two from two and keep on playing that catch-up game to series points leaders, the Ganassi gang. Looks like Boris said aboard the Porsche as we head to pit lane with Brian Till. Tom Nastasi sitting down here getting a cool drink. He needs one. Spent a lot of time in that Mustang, Tom, but it's now parked on pit lane. What put you guys out? The oil pump belt spun off, um, and all of a sudden I saw no oil pressure, so that was that. Well, the Mustang's been so fast. You guys up in the top five, I think up to third or fourth here tonight. But haven't seen a lot of you. How much more are we going to see of you guys for the remainder of the season? Uh, this car is going to do Barber, Montreal, and it might be getting a makeover after that. We're, we're not quite sure. And you're not going to tell us? Uh, I'll tell you what. <laughs> see, see, guys, I asked Jean-Francois Dumala earlier a lot of these questions, and he just kept saying, I don't know. So Tom said he's actually very smart because he didn't give us any of the answers. They've got some interesting things in the pipeline, and uh, they tell us certain things off the record, and, and some exciting times ahead for those boys. Well, I can't remember seeing Boris in a Porsche. That was and, his uh, first time, I think. Th th this would be some work getting Bori, uh, Boris's lanky figure inside a 911. Well, let's ask him about it. Boris said, Dorsey up in the speed booth. You got me, bud? Hey, what's going on, Dorsey? How you doing? Good. Looks like you're pretty cramped in that car. You got enough room for them big legs? Yeah, it's not the most room in the world, these Porsches, but it's a fun car to drive. It, unfortunately, we got a couple laps down. We had a brake problem in the beginning with Larry, but it's running good now. Well, I know you're, you're like Kenny Schrader. You'll drive just about anything, but it's uh, first time in a Porsche, huh? Yeah, first time. So uh, don't tell BMW because I spent 12 years making fun of guys who drive Porsches. So <laughs> I guess now I can make fun of myself. <laughs> well, you have a good time out there, man. There's still a long time in the race to go. Yeah, always. I mean, uh, it's not quite as fast as my uh, Sprint Cup car, but it's still a lot of fun. It, it turns a lot better, that's for sure. Yeah, well, it'd be faster if you didn't turn for the infield. Just go around that oval a few times. I was thinking about using it for practice for Saturday night, but I don't know if the other boys would appreciate it. <laughs> Have a good evening, buddy. See you, Dorsey. From Boris said to Patrick Dempsey, Chris. Well, Patrick Dempsey had to take some races off this spring, but the past few, you've been here three in a row now, and you're back at a racetrack you got to race earlier this year. So how does that help you as a driver develop? Oh, it's just so much easier. Uh, I found that I was much more relaxed in the car, uh, and then I just was really concentrating on little things, going into the braking a lot deeper and seeing to carry more speed out of the corners. And it just felt much more relaxed, which uh, it, in a long run, just your stamina is so much stronger and mentally you're much more aware. And then you can be more aggressive into the braking consistently. And just really just wanted to concentrate on hitting my marks and being consistent and just try to get to the top 10 and stay on the lead lap until I pitted. But it's great to come back to the track, you know, and certainly this is a great track for uh, Mazda. I know this is going to be hopefully a multi-year deal. This year was all about learning. Are you guys hitting your goals? Yeah, we've got a long way to go in this race. I think Joe's capable of bringing it home certainly solidly. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I just want to stay consistent and be in the car. I think it makes a big difference. And we're seeing uh, improvements, and I'm hitting the goals each race that I want to hit. I learned a lot at Mid-Ohio. I mean, to survive that and to stay out, and I couldn't see, but I learned a lot. And uh, that's a fun track. I had a great qualifying there. I feel a lot more comfortable during qualifying. And uh, I think, once again, just feeling really relaxed. I've got to thank Mazda and Specialized and Battery Tender and everybody who's really stuck by us this year and supported us. Well, we've said it before, this team hoping to grow next year into multi-car operation, also hoping to win some races. And if we cast our minds back to the Rolex 24 here in January, this place dealt Patrick a pretty harsh blow during the night on cold tyres when he slammed the pit wall. And he, he told us that he learned from that and it was a pretty harsh lesson. But it's good to see him come back to the speedway with such vigor and such confidence. And he's really getting on the pace towards him. At Mid-Ohio, we qualified within a second and a half of the pole time. So, I mean, that's not too shabby. He's really shown that he can drive a race car quickly and efficiently. Chris, you have something? Well, guys, I checked in with Pirelli, and they said they took a look at the tires on the 10 and the 61, and they saw some signs that the cars went through some debris on the racetrack. So they're saying it looked like those tires were cut down due to debris on the racetrack. Well, that doesn't surprise me either. You know, we've had all this, uh, all these carbon shards are just like little razor blades laying out there. They cut through the tire or anything else pretty quickly. So to get you ready for the restart, the order is Alex Gurney, Scott Pruitt, that rivalry continues between Gainesco and Ganassi. 
Brian Frizzell, Joey Hand and Darren Law, your top five. The Pontiac G8 heads for pit road and we head for the green flag to go racing again. The sole caution is over and we go back racing at the Brumos Porsche 250. This is going to be a shootout, fellas. We've got three of the fastest cars right at the front of the field. Joey Hand will be relishing this opportunity in the Ruby Tuesday Porsche, the new Crawford bodywork, and he's at the front. They did not even get to turn a lap at Mid-Ohio, and here he is challenging uh, Brian Frizzell for third. Drew it deep on the brakes there. Unbelievable, he took a big gap out of Gurney's lead there. Really pulled him in, and Chip Ganassi has 98 victories within his organization. He's looking for number 99 tonight. It's been a wonderful year for their IndyCar program. It has been an amazing year for their Grand Am program. Not so for their Sprint Cup program. We'll see if that success can continue here tonight. Chris? Well, guys, I'm surprised to see Scott Pruitt charging right now because before we went back to green, Tim Keene was on the radio to Scott saying, hey, man, you know what? We're in a really good points position in the championship. If the 99 finishes just in front of us, they're just going to take three points away from us. So let's go out. Let's just run real clean. If we finish behind them, we finish behind them. Did you see the 61, Dorsey? Yeah, Brian Frizzell with some sort of a problem at the back of that car. He's running third right now, but in that last shot we saw of him, there was certainly, Calvin, some sort of smoke or debris coming out from under that. Well, remember that bodywork didn't get cleaned up. He had that big moment, and that right barge board was certainly loose, and that may be getting into the tire there. There you see it, maybe scuffing that tire at speed around this banking. We were surprised that the mechanics didn't tear off that body, but we're seeing sparks again, Dorsey. Oh, that's not good. That's a ride height indicator for sure. And that is going to fly off, and it's going to be a piece of debris that can cut another tire. So I'm really surprised or let it go around like this. This is another team that just needs to catch a break. So close to their podium Look finish, but Pruitt is really <laughs> putting the pressure on Gurney. We talked about great rivalries. It resumes once again. Of course, that sparking could also be some sort of a body part, you know, some sort of a brace. Oh, boy, three wide as we come down into, into the tight part. This is the 86 Farnbacher Lowell's car, the 70 of Sylvain Tremblay, the 69 of Jeff Siegel. Wow, this is hard, fast racing in GT. Bryce Miller is in the middle of that battle as well. He's taken over from Dirk Werner. Oh. The sister cars, the two Mazdas are going at it, and Siegel moves ahead of Sylvain Tremblay. That's one, two, and three in class right there. Did it the hard way around the outside, jumped the curb. These guys are serious. And Look it, at this action. Unbelievable. Different marks, different power plants. The 69, the white Mazda RX-8, Jeff Siegel, young driver, originally from Pennsylvania, now resides in Miami, said, I feel I belong in Grand Am GT racing now. I've got the confidence after getting the win at Watkins Glen. And he said, Course the yellow, Pony Challenge yellow, gave me yellow. an enormous confidence last year. We've got a second full course caution. And again, it's due to debris. And I bet you I know where it came from, too. That's the Ruby Tuesday car, is it? Or is that? Well, that it could be. Maybe the 40 Mazda yeah, as well. it's the Mazda. Yeah, that's what that's it looks it. like. It's the 40s left front fender. Joe Foster's car. Just talking to his teammate Patrick Dempsey, of course. I try to think back to that 61, that rubbing. Maybe the spark, there's little supports at the back of the bodywork. Maybe that's rubbing, Dozzy. Hopefully it's not that, the chassis. Yeah, that's, what I, that's what I was thinking too, Calvin. And those, you know, you've got those braces at the very back, and one of those could be bouncing along on the ground. Well, take a look at the 61, because we know that it's got body damage. Have a look at you the right it? rear, folks, at home. Well, if we get a rear view of it, there might be a, a strut hanging down. You see it flopping around, and it's certainly going to come off. Don't really see anything, Calvin, but... Oh, yeah, there's something, something bouncing around near the exhaust, possibly. Just under the exhaust, you see something? Yeah, that's what it is. You see it sparking right there. From the 61 to the 07, Brian? We talk about the battle between the 69 and the 70. Jeff Siegel may be better off to let the 70 go because the 07 continuing to have problems. They had bad luck at Mid-Ohio, a poor finish, and now Paul Edwards has been hit out on the racetrack. Damage to the right rear, mostly bodywork. They came in, pulled off the rear face, and got the car back on track, but you got to wonder, it was shoved up so far on top of the rear wheel, what the alignment is like. So any way you look at it, the 07 falling back, and that is good news for the boys in the 7-0, the 70 Mazda. Yeah, it was a tough one at Mid-Ohio for these boys, finishing in 11. They did get some championship points, but not as many as they are used to. What can they salvage from tonight?
back under yellow for the second time in quick succession really and hopefully this will be tidied up fairly quickly the 59 Brumos Porsche after all this is the Brumos Porsche 250 and Joao Barbosa behind the wheel of the car and the number that was made famous by both Peter Gregg and of course Hurley Haywood and we've documented many times that Hurley is winding down and we did enjoy him being back in the car at the six hours of the Glen. Chris, he's making a special trip soon over to the Goodwood Festival of Speed along with JC France, and I know he's looking forward to that. Yeah, he is, and there was a big party at the track today. Lee, you thought it was a retirement party, but Hurley said, no way, man. It was just an honorary party. They're not gonna get me out of the seat. <laughs> Hurley, the Goodwood Festival, tell us about that. We're really excited. We got invited over. We're taking my, the first map car that JC and myself won the first Grand Am prototype race with. So we're going to run that up the hill, and we're also going to go over and sort of pitch to the Europeans sort of the Grand Am style of racing. So it should be a good, good show. Well, the 58 has been running so strong the past few weekends. You've also got some good support here from Porsche. Tell us about that this weekend. Well, we've got all the big brass from, from uh, Porsche that came down as our guest. Uh, Manfred Janka, of course, is here from Porsche. Peter Schutz, who used to be the, the chairman of Porsche AG, is here. So if we could win a race, this is going to be the race that we hope that we are going to win. But it, it you know, there's still a, a few laps left, so we'll see what happens. But both cars are running good, and both cars uh, hopefully will be in the top five. Well, good luck. And speaking of laps, and speaking of Daytona, and speaking of Hurley Hayward, that man there has done 18,100 laps of this track. Simply incredible. And the last time a Porsche was victorious at this smaller, shorter, faster event, back in 83. A long time between victories. Can the Porsche boys get there? Can the Ruby Tuesday boys get there? There are Porsches in the hunt for this victory. There we look at it. If we were to finish in the positions they're running right now, that lead that Rojas and Pruitt has would be trimmed just marginally, but that's not going to get it done over this championship season. They need some bigger margins than that for Gurney and Fogarty to get back in this thing. Yeah, that would only gain them three points. And it would, although it would bring it within and under one full race victory, you get 35 points for the victory to GT right now. And as we stand, it would be trimmed dramatically to 26 points. The speed source boys of Nick Ham and Sylvain Tremblay really zeroing in. And of course, three points back of that, Andrew Davis and Robin Liddell are the winners this year. So that's very tight in the GT rank. And that could change a lot because I think uh, Sylvain Tremblay has a car that could potentially win tonight. That's with the position of three. If he gets the win, that's going to change that probably down to about 20 point margin. Now we bring you up to date with what is coming up on the Grand Am schedule. We head off next to the beautiful Barber Motorsports Park in Birmingham, Alabama, then up for a Friday race, August 1st, at Circuit Gilles Villeneuve in Montreal. Then we have just the two Daytona prototype races only. No GTs at the Glen for the short race. Of course, that's another Sprint Cup weekend. And then we head out west to Infineon Raceway. And then a first, New Jersey Motorsports Park. We're all really looking forward to that. And then we head out to Salt Lake City to Miller Motorsports Park a very long and demanding track and this championship this season is far from over we saw some aerial views of the new jersey motorsports park rj valentine sent them to me this week via email track looks very intriguing good layout and the 07 is in I believe brian may be down there paul edwards back in the 07 had a vibration on the right rear and i noticed that uh, the inner lining for the fender well was down on the tire when they came in we talked about the hit that they took. I believe it was probably from the 40 car because there's damage to the left front of the 40, right rear of the 07. But at any rate, they've taken the tire off, replaced it to see if they can get rid of that vibration. If he goes back out and the car still has a vibration in the right rear, probably means that that right rear out of alignment that the hit he took bit to some, some suspension component. So we'll have to wait and see how the 07 fares here. And like I said before, when you're on a super speedway, when you're running in the upper 100 mile per hour, you don't take a chance on something vibrating because, I mean, it's catastrophic. It was very lucky that that tire that, that went away went away where it did. Chris, you got an update for us? 
Well, guys, during the last caution, the 01 was talking about playing it conservative. During this caution, now they're talking about how the 99 was blocking them during that last run of green flag laps. They've talked to Grand Am, said, hey, Gurney's really throwing some moves on us that we can't try and push the car through on. If you guys don't do anything about it and he continues to do it, we'll use the chrome horn. <laughs> that should be interesting. I like to hear. The did, we, uh, some paint. did we say something about rivalry at yeah. the top of this show? Here it is go. on again. We're seconds away from our second restart with Alex Gurney, Scott Pruitt, Brian Frizzell, the top three. Let's go. Let's do it, boys. Don't count out Frizzell, the third car, the golden black machine. Gets a nice jump on Joey Hand. Darren Law's oh. in the mix. So too is Oswaldo Negri. It's tight at the top. Wow, it seems like Pruitt's car comes in a little bit quicker. He's a lot more aggressive into these braking zones when we go back to green. It's Pontiac leading a Lexus, leading a Ford, leading a Porsche. Oh, there. Almost had contact there. Scott does a good job, locks the brakes up. Brian Frizzell yet to win. He's in the hunt still. Gurney was slowing more than Scott thought. He had to use a little bit more brake pressure. That was enough to lock up those Pirellis. Hopefully he didn't flat spot them, recovered it well, just missed the rear end of Gurney's machine. Well, it's a good time on a restart of a race like this to be very aggressive, try to get by someone at the start on this one out lap. Darren Laws made ground on Joey Hand. The two Porsche-powered cars, one a Crawford, one a Riley. That's the fight for the fourth spot. Keep an eye on that. Oswaldo Negri is defending from Joao Barbosa. And we ride with Patterson now. Remember, Bill Orblin said that he's very slow on that straightaway. And uh, Joey Hand is going to have to defend to Darren Law here. If they are that slow, 10, 12 miles an hour, you're a sitting duck. I'd like to excuse myself there. I let Mark Patterson slip. Of course, I just said Oswaldo Negri. So I beg your pardon for that as we look at the front. Pruitt is hanging with Gurney. Darren Law is intensifying this on Joey Hand. Here comes Pruitt, Lexus Power. They typically run this car trimmed out. And here comes the 58 machine. Darren Law goes to the high side around Joey Hand. But this is the battle for the lead at the front. Pruitt gets him. Rounds him up high on the bank and down through the trioval. New race leader. And all the sparks you see flying is because the pressure is not all the way up, I think, yet, Calvin. These guys running very low lines now to be aggressive. Here comes Gurney. Wants it back. You're talking about the tire pressures there. When the tire pressures are low, it means the ride height's a little bit lower. It's going to sit the car down on the deck. And they try and run these race cars as low as you can. That's how they handle without rubbing them away and scrubbing speed. This is a great battle here. Pruitt looks like he's got a bit more straightaway. Look at those brake rotors glowing here. You don't see so much of that glow off of the 99, do you? And it looks like maybe Pruitt's car has a lot of front brake bias, not as much of a well-balanced brake. Oh, and oh, you see a lot of hard. Yeah, he, he is. is pushing hard. You don't typically see Scott Pruitt locking up brakes. He always looks so smooth. That's an indication he is driving 10 tenths right now. You got to wonder, Calvin, if that early lockup didn't give it a little bit of flat spot. He's now having, having trouble with that. There's a replay here coming around the banking doors. He gets the draft nicely. The slipstream effect. He'll jog to the outside. Doesn't have much choice to go to the outside. Alex defends the bottom, but the outside gives you more speed. He drives around. Let's take you back and show you Darren Law's handiwork as well on Joey Hand. Replay here from earlier. Same thing again, Calvin. Look, good draft going to the high side. That gives you more speed, more momentum off the corner. Joey trying to hug the inside line there. It's a little bit bumpy there if you come off NASCAR 4. But a sitting duck, as Bill Orland said, you just don't have the straightaway speed with the aero setup we're running. Well, you run that high line, you're going a further distance, but you're not turning the car down as tightly, and it's quicker. Let's keep an eye out, too, for Ricardo Zonta. He's not too far back in the mix. The 0-1, the Ganassi car, Scott Pruitt, Maymo Rojas, they have won plenty of races, including four this year. They have never won this one. The Brumos Porsche 250. Chris? Well, just as you guys are noticing the lockup on the 0-1 car, Tim Keane also watching our broadcast and telling Scott, hey, you're getting a little bit of lockup. You're attacking real hard right now. Why don't you dial a little bit of brake bias to the rear and just try and run as hard as you can. Once you get in some traffic, you know you can run away from the 99. And Chris, as you said it, you can see now the rear rotors glowing equal to the front. He had too much front brake. He's made the adjustment on the cockpit. Now he's got a real good car.
They've settled after the restart. Pruitt has a one second advantage over Alex Gurney. Then back to Brian Frizzell in the top three. Will Rojas go to victory lane for the fifth time this year? We'll find out soon. It is fast and furious in the mid pack in the Daytona prototypes. Welcome back to the Brumos Porsche 250. There's an angry little bunch here. Well, it's not <laughs> such a little bunch, and they are fighting fiercely. Up front, it is still Scott Pruitt over Alex Gurney by just over a second, and Brian Frizzell. But Oswaldo Negri has been catapulted up into the top four, courtesy of Darren Law running off track while we're in the commercial break. There's Darren there. He's regrouped. He's back up to speed. But let's show you a replay of what went down and the traffic jam that ensued. He's coming down into the bus stop chicane. We're going to see what happens to Darren Law here. Here you see him swamp being passed by cars left, right and centre. We're going to take another look at this. And look at Ian James there in the six getting really aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> this is a sort of ugliness. I say it all the time. Watch what happens up here. There's the trouble. Uh, Darren goes off. And then that stacks everybody up behind him. And then you get yourself in a position like Ian James did where he drove down in there and you think, oh man, yeah. I wish I wouldn't have done that. That was maybe. fantastic. I mean, we had fourth through 14th within three seconds of each other on the racetrack just a lap ago. And the 61 car is on pit road. The 61 car is on pit road. So that puts Oswaldo Negri up to third. Brian Frizzell bringing the pole sitting car in. Now Negri is defending. He's got people chasing him everywhere. Look and at look this, at man. Ryan Dial in the two. He has snuck up to. into this quietly. He's the victor from Laguna Seca along with Henry Zogabe. And they missed some practice this morning. Qualified well at the back of the field, but they've kept on that lead lap. And now Ryan Diel is strutting his stuff, as we always see with that BMW power in the Samax machine. Can you look at Ricardo Zanta in the green car, and it's also showing signs of having a lot of front brake on. We'll see if he gets any lockup. I don't see any red at his rear rotors. And he's under pressure from Ryan Diel. He has. And Diel has some speed here. Let's see how it shows up on this banking. Spoke to him in the transporter this afternoon. He said, we seem to be down on the straight line speed that we typically see here, but obviously getting good lap time out of the race car. They thought they'd find out what the problem was. Let's look and see. The last car in shot is Max Angelelli. Unfortunately, he is a lap down, playing catch up, and is down in 17th position. We ride with Angelelli, looking at these three up ahead, fighting it out. It is Ryan Dial, that BMW-powered Riley. He is chasing Ricardo Zonta in the Pontiac-powered Lola and Oswaldo Negri in that Ford-powered Riley. Brian? Chris? Well, guys, just when we thought the 61 was hopefully going to break through, grab a win tonight. Big problems again for this team. It looks like they're going to have to replace a right rear half shaft on this car. You can imagine the load that it took when Mark Wilkins had that spin up in NASCAR 3 and 4. And uh, not only did it do some bodywork damage, but it looks like it's done some suspension and driveline damage, too. So Brian Frizzell complained that he had a big vibration in the rear of the car, brought the car in, and the team now looking that they're going to have to change this half shaft. Boy, that's a shame, but I, Chris, I think you're right. That slam down off of the uh, off of the banking onto the apron probably did do that damage. The view for Angelelli, he would so dearly love to be in this fight if it worked for position for him. However, he is not in this mix. You're looking at the fight for third, fourth, and fifth. Negri, Zonta, and Dial. Ten seconds up ahead of these guys is Alex Gurney and Scott Pruitt. First and second have bolted. Look at Dial trying to work Zonta, the former F1 driver. No passage through there. And spare a thought for the AIM Autosport boys. They showed us what they're capable of. Great work. This fight for the final spot in the top three is still as intense as when we left you and went to the break. We say welcome back to Daytona International Speedway. You're watching Grand Am on speed under the lights. The Brumos Porsche 250 and Oswaldo Negri there in the orange and black. Ford powered Riley holds on to third at the moment. Zonta and Dial were just having a fierce scrap during the break and Max Angelelli got in the middle of it. Of course, he is a lap down trying to get back on the lead lap. Chris? Well, Ricardo Zonta having a great run right now, running fourth. 
And this team dealing with a few brake issues, though. Zonta's saying he's having some problems with pedal fuel. Now, the first thing is he's having a lot of kickback. What that means is as the car's moving around, the, the brake pads are being pushed back from the caliper. So when he goes to the brake pedal, he's got a little bit of a long brake pedal before the, the car really starts to stop. The other thing, really high temperatures. The tight packs that they're running in, he's not getting enough air to those brakes. When the car came in for its last pit stop, the crew said they've seen the hottest temperatures they've ever seen on those rotors. They said they were so hot, they could pretty much see through those steel rotors. And Chris, we've got a new race leader. Alex Gurney has put the Gainsco Pontiac in front. Where did that come from? I mean, he worked over Pruitt, caught up with him, yeah. and blasted. Oh, and here's Max Angelelli off the racetrack. He was fighting to get that lap back. He was, and he was right in the middle of that battle with Dial and Zonta. So you have to wonder if he was helped off the racetrack here. This is in the bus stop. Well, the they last were, thing this team needs, Dorsey, is more damage to a race car. No, that's for sure. They were really having to go up at Dial and Zonta. And, of course, Max Angelelli in the middle of it. Let's see what happens. This is down, of course, breaking for the inner loop. There he is, There's GT a Porsche car. in the way. Oh, he got tagged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dial got oh, into the back was of him. Yeah, was a hit. The 74 Porsche of Derek Skay. Watch, watch Dial. Right, right here. 34, oh, I take oh. that back. Is that GT car he got into, Dorsey, which turned him yeah, around? Yeah, I'm wrong. You're absolutely right. So, you know, I understand he's a race driver. He's going to be pushing up. When you're a lap down, why do you want to be taking these sort of chances? Keep it clean. Get it to the next race. Yeah, he is a full lap down. Unfortunately, now it's going to get worse. Now, as the SunTrust team go to work, let's join Brian. Ten car on pit road right now. Damage to the rear of the car, and the guy at the right rear having a difficult time getting the right rear tire off because the engine cowl and the rear bodywork forced into this right rear tire. So nothing can be done with the tires until this bodywork is removed from the car so that they can get the wheels off and uh, along and costly stop. The night had gone bad enough for Wayne Taylor and the rest of the Sun SunTrust team, but this just adds a little bit of injury to the insult from earlier, guys. Every time they seem to get ahead, heading in the right direction, they just get belted backwards. I think they may be calling it a night, Dorsey. I mean, they're not in the championship chase. Yeah. Typically, the team has worked feverishly to get him back out, but this season is just basically over with. They just want to get some victories. Let's take you back and show you how Alex Gurney got around Scott Pruitt for the lead of this motor race with just 10 laps to go. Fred Pruitt has a problem because he caught him very quickly but seen Pruitt pass Gurney on the straightaway. And let's look and see what happens, Dorsey. Look at the brake. Look at the brakes yeah. now. The huge glow on Scott's car and it didn't slow up very much, did it? I wonder if Pruitt's got some braking issues. We've seen those extreme temperatures and the glowing of those rotors and uh, he was on the brakes early brian well, i did talk to john fogarty earlier right after that restart he said we've been monitoring the zero ones radios all night long on fresh tires or on restarts the car is very good and they are definitely faster than we are we have a big push on restarts or fresh tires but the car gets better and better as we go the zero one seems to get loose so whether Pruitt has a problem with brakes right now or whether it's a setup issue and the tire getting loose, either way you look at it, the longer it stays green, the better it is for the boys in red. Problems for Oswaldo Negri here. Front right, damage. Flat tire, I think, is all that there is. I'm not sure from what yet. Rim is damaged, Dorsey, like yeah. you might have clobbered someone. I don't know if he made... Uh, he's obviously going to have to come in. Uh, that's... The left front and right, left, left side, front and rear, or just left front? So this is the only left front, please. Now, the replay may tell us a little more, Dawson Cal, as to what happened to the Brazilian. Take a look here, Calvin. You saw, yeah, there's, I, I see the, wow, oh, look, he's got, got brake fire right. on the right front. Yeah. Do you see it? Yeah, right side, no car into him, so something was going on. And he'd already lost third to Zonta, and Dial had got by for fourth, so he was in trouble already. We'll find out why when we come back, and we're inside the final 10 laps. Stick around.
Second podium of the year was on offer for Oswaldo Negri, but have a look at what happens between the 60 and the 06. Down into turn one, it got really ugly there for a moment, and I think there was a slight collision there between the 06 and the 60. The Zanta makes the move around the outside, on board now with Negri. Absolutely, the right rear touched the left front of the Pontiac, right cut outside. the rim down, and you saw the sparks immediately right show up. And of course, That was the hit there, it was the right front of the 60 to the left front of the 06. And we're under caution for the third time tonight. And this is why the 30, this is the Racers Edge RX-8, and Ross Smith is behind the wheel. There you can see he's lost a radiator, a oil cooler. There's a line of, of fluid leading to the car. The hood's up, front end smashed. This is a great little team. This car was running well here tonight with Craig Stone also uh, joining Ross in the car tonight. So. Uh, John Maraki runs a great operation, made the switch from the Pontiac to the Mazda this year and gets some great results. Certainly showing strong performance week in, week out. Once again, that's down on that new paved part. I think that's a great idea on you, Dorsey, yeah, in terms absolutely. of safety instead of gravel traps and tire barriers. Just big black top areas allows the driver to try and recover from a moment or a mechanical failure. Let's hear from Chris Neville. Chris, go ahead. Well, guys, I know you were speculating on possibly some brake situations with the Telmex car. However, Pruitt talking to his team, saying the car just a little bit too loose. And we know Pruitt is a throttle jockey. That's what his team calls him. He's either on or off the gas. So in that type of driving style, he likes the car a little bit tight coming off the corners. So when he goes hard to the throttle, the back end sticks. Right now, that's the problem. The back end is not sticking, so the Telmex car is fading. So this caution is a good thing. It's going to give him a chance to cool those tires for hopefully a little five or six lap run. Brian? Down at the other end of pit lane, Ryan Dial has brought the number two C-Max Riley BMW to pit road. Just talked to Peter Barron. The car had been up to fourth, and it looked like they might have a good shot to move on up the order to third, but the radio report is contact with a GT car and a broken axle oh, on nah. the two. So Ryan Dial, after such a great run, now sits on pit road. Their evening is over with. He stormed through the field. Race winner from Mazda Raceway, Laguna Seca, he and Henry Sogate. He was just coming through, he was flying. He's a star in one of these cars. Remember the Rolex two years ago when he was battling yeah. out with the likes of Montoya and uh, really was his uh, coming out party in uh, Daytona prototypes here for Peter Barron. Well, here's why our caution's out for sure is the 30 sits there having had a collision with another car, it sounds like. So uh, we finally found a replay of all this. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Dial was involved there with Ross Smith. And as he's sitting in a very bad place, cars are going ballot. Oh, you nailed by Jeff Bucknam. That explains all the fluid, doesn't it? That was a huge hit. Jeff Bucknam joining James Gueye in the Stevenson Motorsport Corvette. So. Uh, he hasn't been to Daytona in a couple of years. He did the test here a couple of years, but hasn't raced in four years. So returning to uh, Rolex competition, Jeff Bucknam. You know what that reminded me of? Do you remember a few years ago, it was back in 03 in the SRP2 class Alberto. with Andrew Davis, and uh, it was Larry Alberto and Andrew Davis, and it was a head-on yeah. right. They're very similar, although well, it was side-on. Very, very similar when you come around turn one, and sometimes if you're slightly distracted. What year was it? 203. I, I can't remember yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, go for it. Well, you guys saw the problems with the 60 car, the contact cutting down that right front, but also problems with the 6 car. Ian James pushed behind the wall, a half shaft on that car. Now, that's the third half shaft tonight. Now, I think the first one with the 61 was because of the spin up on the banking. Then the 2 car, the contact. The 6 car, no contact, so just a failure. I asked Mike Shank about that. He said, you know what, these are the same half shafts. We run for the 24-hour race, so just obviously some weird fluke failure. The attrition rate is rapidly increasing. In the closing laps of the Brumos Porsche 250, who'll get it? Has Pruitt got anything for Gurney? We'll find out. Rolex Sports Car Series fans will remember that great drive at Laguna Seca by Ryan Dial, but here at Daytona, Ryan, another great drive going, but thwarted. What happened out on the track? Uh, first of all, I need to say congratulations to Samax. We had a really difficult start to the day, and uh, I think to even be running for a podium position was amazing for my guys. We, we do a great job every week and uh, I don't know, I mean, Zona seems to have some European ways and coming from there I, I learned to respect the way racing is in America and ended up clipping me a couple of times and it eventually uh, took out the drive shaft. They're pretty, 
They're pretty delicate pieces when you hit square on, so hands are racing there in the podium. And I know a local guy, you live in Orlando now, Calvin says that you told him you like the humidity, but uh, I'm thinking it's pretty sticky down here on pit road. I think I look great just now, so I don't know. I mean, once the adrenaline takes over your face, once you get out of the car, you start to feel it. But just disappointing for all the guys. They did a, a great job, as always. A great job, as always. You know, when they won at Laguna Seca, it was for Peter Barron's birthday. They were trying to get the win today because tomorrow night, Henry Zogabe's birthday. And we Lee. go back to Mazda Raceway, Laguna Seca. Boy, it was hard, fast, tough racing. That was Dial getting by Mark Goosens. He made a little mistake on the way up the hill. Goosens was able to capitalize, and Ryan said, at this point, I said to myself, there is no way Goosens is winning this race. I am going all the way to victory lane, and he and Henry Zogabe did. Time to celebrate with team owner Peter Barron. That was a high moment in their 2008 racing season. We're still under yellow and we are working our way towards a very fast sprint to the chequered flag. Let's find out more from the co-driver of the 01 car, Mamo Rojas. Well, Mamo down here watching his teammate finish this one out. Mamo, we know the car is loose right now. Scott having a chance to cool his tires. Are you guys going for the win, or do you take your second place points and move on to the next one? I think if our tires uh, get to cool off and off, I think we have a shot. Uh, once they get uh, really hot, uh, we start to lose a lot of grip, especially in the rear. So, so as you can see in our, on our first laps, uh, we can run pretty quick. So we'll see if they really cool down. Well, how hard is Scott going to push to try and get a win here? Well, obviously the priority is still the championship. Uh, we're not going to do anything silly, but uh, every race win counts, and uh, we're not coasting at, at all in this uh, championship, so we'll see. Well, it's going to be interesting. Is Pruitt going to do some points racing, guys? We will find out. Speaking of points, there are a lot on offer for Sylvain Tremblay. And how about their playground, the Daytona International Speedway? They won the Rolex 24 in the GT class, and Sylvain is leading the way. He and Nick Ham, now sister car, their teammates are right behind Jeff Siegel and Emil Asentato. So it's Mazda 1 2, and then Bryce Miller for Fan Barker Lowell's runs in third at the moment ahead of Robin Liddell. Championship hopeful in the Stevenson Pontiac. Where are the points leaders? They are one position further back. Paul Edwards is in fifth. Now points as of now, compared to the last time we showed you, they, they uh, lop off another four. So they're within 22 of the championship leaders. But I tell you, for the Pontiacs, they'll be pleased to be running up in the top five. Robin Liddell currently runs fourth in the 57 machine and Paul Edwards and uh, Kelly Collins running fifth. They are the championship leaders, and they thought they could have got her even more damage control is what they said they were looking for here today. Hang on, Dorse. Here we go. Are you ready? This is the sprint to home. Six to go. Five make it. Who will do it? Alex Gurney was really, really aggressively scrubbing his tires that time. He also knows Pruitt's good on this restart, and his car not that good. And he knows that Pruitt's going to make a move. It needs to be early, because once Gurney's car comes in, he seems to have the pace to keep the lead. This is where Pruitt is aggressive into these first few corners after the restart. Gurney's car through that corner had a lot of understeer. Pruitt's car more neutral, gets a better run through. Pruitt has never won this shorter race here under lights at one stage for many years was called the Paul Revere 250 these days the Brumos Porsche 250 Darren Law working his way through Zonta is too far back so too is Darren Law it's down to these two cars the Pontiac and Lexus powered Rileys of Gainsco and Ganassi that car being loose Dorsey it must be loose on entry because we saw Gurney just fly by Pruitt under braking into the bus stop on that lap where he took the lead and before we'd seen Pruitt have greater straightaway speed so Scott was really feeling it in terms of the car not being underneath him and just uh, backing off quite considerably. And like I said, Alex really was much, much more aggressive on trying to keep the temperature on his tires up on this restart than he has on those past couple. Back to Ricardo Zonta. Boy, the Crone Proto Auto boys would be delighted with a podium here at Daytona. If Zonta can hang in there, Darren Law will be pushing for his third consecutive podium along with David Donahue. And Mamo Gidley has put in a... Oh, oh, oh. That is Jeff Siegel, and that car has flipped big time. And he's not in a good place right now either, right down the apron. Somebody went below him. This is up on the banking. A wild now, ride there, Dorsey. Look at the damage. Hopefully he's okay. See no. some movement in the cockpit. 
Now there's a full course that we'll probably end up ending under, unfortunately. Yes. Well, the key will take a while to get Jeff out of that car safely. I mean, they could probably clear the wreckage pretty quick. Four to go. When you're under caution, it takes about twice as long to run around this racetrack. So we're probably looking at about 10 minutes left in this race. We got, a, you know, there's going to be a lot of debris out there. That car, when we saw it, was already upside down. It's on the banking, so you're going really quick at that point. And I'm sure. I wonder if he dropped a wheel somewhere there, doors to, to flip it over. Something's got to trip it. Yeah. Maybe and he dropped a wheel going through the. Now yeah, they got the rescue boys to him. He's moving around inside. That's a very strange, you know, with the, with these sports cars, you don't see. You don't see that happen on the banking so no. much. All right, let's go to a replay and show you what happened with Jeff Siegel and his speed source Mazda. Now, this is starting way early. There's Sylvain Tremblay in the black. You've got the three car behind. That's the Southern Lexus. Oh, he didn't oh. know he was there, and he turns him into the oh, wall whoa, and shovels whoa, him over. Whoa. Well, that was... Bill Lester in the three went high, went wide. Jeff Siegel. Oh. Dare I say that was a a mild ride compared to what it might have been. Yeah. Lucky it came to rest low down. Here we see another view from the 87 on board. Oh. Again, real time. rough landing you know when you get up in the air and you start flipping it's just up in the air but all of those contacts uh, were pretty pretty hard ones and Jeff Siegel in the back of the ambulance and we'll go to the infield medical center and there he is out of the car obviously this was just a few seconds ago and a lucky driver yeah devastating blow though to Mazda I mean they needed a pad we have Sylvain in the lead. They needed to spread that gap in the points to the 07. This hurts them. Remember that huge crash from uh, from out there at Miller that, that Nick Ham had after yes. he got contacted? Yeah. A similar type of flip, a pretty big, vicious flip, but the car landed, only went one time over and landed back on its wheels. So, like you said, Calvin, that, that was good because it could have really started going. So will we have time to get this situation cleaned up and finish under green? Bill Lester was the man in the cockpit of the three Southern car. Brian, tell us more. Well, the Southern car just a pit road, guys. Uh, extensive damage to the nose and the splitter was down, so the team had to put a new nose on that car. A lot of uh, grating along the right side wall, or right side of that car as well, so obviously Lester moving as far to the right as he could to try to get away from the 69, and obviously Siegel didn't see him as Lester tried to go around the outside of him. The two got together and you saw the result, but Bill Lester in the three car has managed to get back on track. Yeah, Brian, you're absolutely right. Bill drove all the way up to the wall to avoid yeah. Siegel, who didn't know he was there. Now, if you're in a slower car, the rule of thumb is that when you exit that inner loop and you come back on the banking, you should run the lower lane, right. not transition to the wall, because there can always be a prototype car hiding up there, and it was. So, with any luck, we may be able to have... I think they'll get this cleaned There's up. There's a chance here, but uh, we'd like to see a few more crew out there looking at any potential debris. they just got to get the car drug out of the way, and hopefully there'll be no resultant body parts left and strewn across the racetrack. Well, this has been a uh, fascinating race for a variety of reasons, and this has added to it. Let's take you back one more time and show you Jeff Siegel's wild ride. Exiting the chicane there, and there you see he goes all the way out, doesn't give a lane for Bill Lester, who had committed to the outside. Bill kept his foot in it there and basically just plowed him over, Doss. Yeah, and of course the speed differential of the two cars, the prototype car versus the GT, dictates that the prototype car has got to go to the wall. Right. They can't keep the car from not going there, right. whereas the GT cars don't have to run that high up. Unfortunately, they came together, and it's a blind spot. There's no doubt about it because you're up on the bank. We could end up, boys, with a one-lap shootout. Oh, boy. Brian. Guys, on that last restart, one of the things that I did here, scanning the radios down here, is the 0-1 team telling Scott Pruitt, 
your tire pressures are not good. So on the restarts in the past where they had talked about how good the 0-1 car was when the tires were cool, it seems like the caution not long enough to let the pressures dissipate and those temperatures come down a little bit. So Pruitt did not have the car that he had had on some of the past restarts. We'll have to wait and see how long this yellow is, see if we get back to racing. And if we do, did those pressures go down enough? Will Scott Pruitt have a uh, car that he can go to the front with? Chris, what do you know? Brian, I just checked in with Tim Keene on what you were saying, and he said the big problem is is because the car is so loose, the pressures on the rear were not looking about the same as the ones on the front. So they've been running really high on the rear because he just can't get off any of the corners, and he's spinning the tires. So the pressures at the rear were pretty high, the pressures up front pretty low, so that car just wasn't under good balance. Now you got to wonder to yourself, if, is he in trouble on losing second place? You know, if the car's that misbalanced... I think he has to think big picture here. It's not worth risking it. If your car's strong, yeah, then go for it like he did on an earlier restart. But if he's got a wounded car, just bring it home. Second place points. Yeah, you've got a big enough lead. Absolutely. Well, we've got three to go, and they're, they're working the banking. You see right there the Mars are getting pushed up on the, pulled up on the flatbed. In the history of the Daytona prototypes, there has never been a repeat winner of this summertime sprint race here at Daytona International Speedway. The inaugural Daytona prototype champion, Terry Borchella and Forrest Barber won it back in 03. Angelelli and Taylor won it in 04. Andy Wallace and Butch Leitzinger won it in the Pontiac Crawford in 05. In 06, it was York Bergmeister and Colin Brown in a Ford Riley, and last year, it was the Gainesco guys. See, I think by trying to get it on that flatbed door, see, they're having problems there. There's the angle of the banking they're having to deal with. I would have thought that car could have just been drunk out of the way. We only got a couple of laps to go here. Just get it in a safe spot. You don't need to get it back to the paddock area. Well, if they drug it down onto the flat, at least they would have been able to yeah. make it uh, in a better situation. To tow it maybe off into here, but now we're down to two to go. And, of course, they don't have it up on there yet. There it is. There That's good go. news. That's good news. Seems like the pace car slowed the field a little bit more. They can adjust that pace speed, of course, to uh, try and gain you a little bit of time. Brian, I know you've got Bob Stallings with you. We are going racing. We're here next time. Bye. Well, guys, trying to get Bob Stallings. He's up on the box right now, paying attention to what's going on. Bob, take a minute of your time real quick. You know, after Mid-Ohio, you said winning is something that you'd forgotten how to do, and you guys were back at it. You're going to have a two-lap run here for this checkered flag. You got a, strong, a car that's strong enough to get it done? Uh, definitely, for sure. You know, I told the guys right before Mid-Ohio that we need to think about this as a, as a new season for us. Last time we went to a restart, there was GT traffic between the 01 and the 76. Since the DP cars were able to clear that GT traffic, this time very different. Now Pruitt's got to look out for the 76 and the Brumos cars that are directly behind him. The Gainesco 99 machine started the year in positive fashion. Finished runner-up to Scott Pruitt and Dario Franchitti and won Pablo Montoya and Memo Rojas. But since then, they went five consecutive races with no podium and then as we've already mentioned the win at mid ohio can they go back to back it's looking strong zonta's in the mix darren law is there joao barbosa there's Mamo gidley and joey hand that's a sweetener for alex job's ruby tuesday championship racing to be in the top 10 and to be in seven matt plum has got the seagull sport rum bum bmw up there into eight antonio garcia for chiva and mark antoine cameron the spirit of Daytona Porsche is in the top 10. See the drivers really weaving around, trying to generate some tire temp, get the tire pressures up. But you know that Gurney is going to be on the gas early. He doesn't want to stack everyone up and let everyone have a go at him, Dorsey. I imagine this restart will be pretty quick. Boy, everybody's tightening their belts up right now. They're taking a deep breath because they're not going to have to breathe again for the next two laps. They're coming round to face a one-lap sprint. This will be it. Will we see a savage, desperate move from the master, Scott Pruitt? Well, will Zonta, focus. will Zonta try and get the Proto Auto Lola's first victory? And Darren Law, remember, he's had back-to-back -back second placings. He wants a victory. The two Brumos Porsches are in the mix at the Brumos Porsche 250.
This is fascinating heading into the final lap. He has stacked them up, Dorsey. I'm surprised that this Ken Pruitt take advantage here. A master of restarts, but Alex Gurney puts the foot down. Green flies, and so too does the white. We are on our way home. A one lap sprint. Great start by Gurney. Took it to the top side to get the radius for turn one. Pruitt's close. Can he make a move down here into the braking zone? Couple of car lengths. That should be enough for Gurney. Safe there for Alex Gurney. Knows that, that is a passing opportunity, but that's gone. These two have cleared Santa. He's under pressure from the two Brumos Porsches. And they're up under pressure from one another. Look at Joao going down the inside. Woo! <laughs> Law has the line through the kink. Pruitt is not letting Gurney get away. This is not done yet. And you can tell by the brake rotor covers that he's smart on those brakes. Zonta's clear. He's safe in third at the moment. The win is not Alex Gurney's just yet. Through a hard on the brakes. The rear end trying to jump out from underneath him. This is the GT battle. Tremblay at the front. There's a scramble there. There's a hard scramble. And plenty in the mix. Everybody in the mix. Terry Borchella has got that car up to second or third. The auto house Pontiac. Great work there. Bryce Miller's in the mix. So too Andy Lally. And look at the Brumos Porsches. The teammates fighting it out for position. Barbosa will have the line here. It's a braking duel. Darren got on the brakes later, but he didn't have the line. Barbosa flies through the chicane. Can Gedley get to Law? Meanwhile, back at the front. Now it's all the draft on the big banking, and here comes Pruitt trying to get by. Back-to-back -back wins for the 99 Gaines Co. team. Bob Stallings, boys, they do it. Not only... Well, it's not there yet, is it? Is Pruitt going to do what the 61 did? He comes one high. Who's going to get it to the line? Pruitt, Scott it. Pruitt gets it. Wow, just when you thought the Gaines Co. boys had it wrapped up, the master does it. High and wide, the secret for Scotty. That was a NASCAR move that he learned here before. Take it to the top, carry the momentum, and it'll bring you by at the finish. Eight hundredths of a second was the winning margin. Just when the Gaines Co. boys thought they had it, so did we. But Pruitt knew something that we didn't. How about that? Eight hundredths of a second. And it's all right here. Take the high road around. How many times have you seen it in the Daytona 500? It gives you momentum. Good clean racing there by Alex Gurney. Let him have that high line. He didn't shove him up in the wall. Great racing by two of the best in the Rolex series. Simply brilliant. Simply brilliant. And Tim Keane, team manager, celebrates with his men, and rightly so. That is win number five for the championship points leaders. Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is brought to you by Rolex, a crown for every achievement. And by Mazda. On any given weekend, there are more Mazdas road raced than any other brand. Ever heard of the saying, it's not over till it's over? This man here just proved it. By 0 0.081 of a second, the closest ever winning margin in Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series history, Chris. Well, this team celebrating down here, just like when they won the Rolex 24 earlier this year. We thought Pruitt might be doing some points racing. It didn't happen. Scott, Dorsey was saying that was just a textbook Daytona pass. Oh, uh, dude, it was, uh, wow, unbelievable. You know, it's never over till it's over. We definitely had a different setup. We were uh, definitely quicker on the straightaway than, uh, than the 99 car. And they were quicker through the infield. and. We got it done. I mean, I held my breath through the bus stop. But, the, you know, Ganassi guys did a great job. Telmex, Memo, hi to my family at home. And also uh, performance. They gave me a good drink again, as always. So, awesome day. Awesome. Well, they gave some points to the 99 at Mid-Ohio. They take them back today. Brian? Well, that they did, Chris. Alex Gurney just climbed out of the 99 car, and the car looks so strong there, and the ladder going's so good on restarts. But there, Dorsey up in the booth saying that's just a textbook Daytona move, or do you guys wish you could flatten out that rear wing a little bit, take some downforce out? Um, yeah, so, something like that. Something like that. Yeah, it's definitely a, a tough pill to swallow for sure. I mean, uh, it looked like we, we had it under control, and uh, I knew I had to get a, a, a good enough gap in front of him, you know, going into the chicane or else I was toast because uh, 
he was definitely coming like a freight train on the straight. So, uh, you know, that, that's a real tough one today for sure. But anyway, I think the team did a great job. We executed on everything perfectly, as, as good as we could. So, uh, tough day. Tough day, but congratulations on a great run anyway, Alex. Lee? Yeah, that is a bitter one to swallow, isn't it? And we take you to the points, and it now blows out to more than a race victory plus five. So 40 is the difference to the Ganassi boys over the Gainsco boys and the 91 of Jim Matthews and Mark Goosens a further 19 back over the 60 and then the 76 of Nick Jonsson, Ricardo Zonta. That podium tonight really helped their position. That was a good one for the Chrome boys. It really was a great result for those guys to get, finally get that podium finish, but Alex Gurney was gutted there. You could tell, Dorsey. I mean, he is a gentleman. I think he's thinking maybe there's more power than his just aero, because they've been uh, kind of saying all season long, we don't seem to be seeing the straightaway speed as some of the other power plants out there. Well, this old racetrack, the girl had something in it for today, closest in the history. I mean, that was breathtaking. Time to talk GT with Brian Till. Uh, another great run for Nick Ham and Sylvain Tremblay in that Mazda. Gaining points steadily on the 07 car. Is it true that you actually have the keys to this racetrack, Sylvain? I think so. Uh, just really concerned about our 69 car with, with Jeff. You know, just had a horrible shunt. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, the Castrol Syntec was very, very strong today. You know, we, we have we have the keys to this place. We know what it takes to get around here. Uh, the strategy, we were almost spot on to what we had dreamed would happen. Nick just did a perfect, perfect, perfect first stint. Uh, nailed the pit stop, uh, pit selection, all those little things. So the, the support of Mazda and Castro, and we're back in victory lane for the third time at Daytona. Pretty awesome. Congratulations, guys. How about that? Yeah, superb performance. Incidentally, Dirk Werner and Bryce Miller grabbed second over Robin Liddell and Andrew Davis with the points leaders finishing fourth today for Kelly Collins and Paul Edwards. And look at that. It's down to 24 ahead of the Stevenson boys and then Tim George there by himself. It was a good hard run in today's race, incidentally, for Ted Ballou and Andy Lally. They got their Porsche up into the top five. How about that? It's celebration times now for Mamo Rojas and Scott Pruitt. We'd like to celebrate the SunTrust Improve Your Position Award. We congratulate the 59 Brumos Porsche of JC France and Joao Barbosa making up a tremendous amount of positions and well done to the 65 TRG Porsche of Hema Mayer and Craig Stanton making up 12 positions just like the 59. Let's go back one more time to relive that and Dorsey talk us through. This was something else. Scott does what you do here. He has momentum going. He goes to the top side. That gives him that ability to get that, what, eight hundredths? Yeah. Eight hundredths of a second. Unbelievable. Just like that. And that's why he's smiling, just like that. Spare a thought for the Gainsco boys, because to lose by that margin is just gutting. But the celebration will be worthy of that marvelous finish within the Ganassi camp. We look ahead to the Porsche 250 at Barber Motorsports Park in Alabama. That will be a hot, hard day's work, and we look forward to that one. It'll be a great show. Uh, high down force of work at that racetrack. They won't be trimming them out like Scott Pruitt did here tonight. 99 wins for Chip Ganassi Racing. They'll be looking for number 100 somewhere this weekend. There were two winners here today. Only, only one of them gets the trophy, Harper. Yeah, that was a tremendous one. Spare a thought for the guys who didn't have such a great day. And how about that from Scott Pruitt? Proving, as he said, it is never over until it's over. Glad you could be with us. For the Brumos Porsche 250, it sure was spectacular, right down to the checkered flag. You've been watching Grand Am on speed. We'll see you in two weeks at Barber Motorsports Park.